back corner <laughs> when I'm not presenting. Listening in. And listen in. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bash University Live here on Tuesday night. Take a quick break. Watch John Cruz's on the Tokyo rig. Be a part of the show. Get some chances to win some awesome prizes. Fast you go. You know, we didn't have that back then. And, 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 dude, it, it could just... That text thread gives me so much energy. I mean, like I'm dialing. Welcome to Bash University live on a Tuesday night. Really enjoy uh, doing the show and talking to all you guys. And, and we get so many great conversations with all of our subscribers around the country that watch the show. Download the podcast. By the way, uh, we are available via podcast uh, wherever you get your, your podcast. Go download it and listen to it. Listen to it at work. You have my permission. Uh, get after it. We're going to have a a great show tonight. I'm, I'm really excited about tonight's show because uh, three of the Bashu family have done extremely well, and I'm so proud of them. Uh, they're going to the All-American uh, for the BFLs. They qualified uh, just this past week, and um, it, it's great to see. We're going to have them all on the show tonight. Uh, we have Matt Henry. We have Alabama Mike Reed and our own JK, professional fish head, Justin Kimmel, they've all qualified and are going uh, to the All-American. It's been a year of the BFLs here at the Bash U. Uh, we've, we've all participated at some level and had a blast. We've uh, inter the, the BFLs are the working man's tournament trail. It's, uh, it, it has a tremendous um, participation. Over 30,000 people participate in the BFLs this, in this past year. At least that's the, the number that I, that I remember. We're, we're gonna have Daniel Fennell on, who is the director of the BFLs. He's gonna be able to give us all the real numbers and what's happening there over in that organization. It's, it's been great. I fished it back in the Operation Fast days um, wow. and the Red Man days, and now the BFLs. And it's, it's, been, a, it's been a true uh, weekend anglers, weekend warrior tournament trail the best of the best uh battling on their home bodies of water it's it, it's been it's great com competition i had a blast fishing it this year and uh excited excited to have tonight's show so uh so here we go i see jk you're you're on already with with me and uh man congratulations what a great accomplishment oh man thank you so much i can't stop smiling and you know why it's not just because we accomplished what Hardly was the goal when we set out this this year fishing as a co-angler again, and uh, somehow we're sitting here, but somebody needs to pinch me because a couple of my best buds made it too, and just to get to be a part of that is just can't help but smile, but dude, you are the uh, the motivator, man. You had a heck of a season too, you know. you It was a narrow miss on your regional, but uh Angler of the Year. I know we've talked about it a little bit, but uh, we haven't talked to you since your regional. You still had a great tournament, and you know, just you really helped motivate me. You you had a great summer. You know, something I'll say real quick is my health was down. You know, when I got sick this summer, I wasn't in fishing shape. It was hard for me to mentally get back. And you riding your little hot streak there every time you're going <laughs> fishing, man. It was just so helpful and motivating for me to get back in the right mindset to get, you know, to, to get back there for the regional. And, you know, well, it's a heck of a weekend. So thank you so much, man. Oh man. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I wouldn't be fishing the BFLs if not for your, your nudge and, and, uh, and, you know, provocation. It was, uh, you know, you got me and Riz fishing them last year and, and I jumped into them this year, had a blast, and and it was great, you know, finishing where I finished and uh, getting that accomplishment. Really wanted to get out there to the All American. Never been, never been. It's my first full year in the BFLs. I I wanted to go, and uh, so many of the great anglers. And it's amazing, I, you know. Uh, we have a list we're going to go over today. How many anglers that have won the All American? 
that have gone on to fame and fortune in the bass fishing world. It, it really is the who's who uh, in fishing. So a, a lot of tremendous anglers have done that. So it's, it, it's uh, but I would, we'll do it again. Maybe next year we'll, we'll see it happens. A lot of fun. I love doing it. And, uh, and uh, we'll see, maybe we can drag uh, BTC and the Riz. I know Riz started out with us this year and, uh, and decided to go in a different direction, but I, I kind of think, that Rich has got his sights set on the whole season next year. What, what do you think there, Riz? Richard? You know, uh, I think that would be very accurate, Pete, because uh, <laughs> one, being at the uh, regional uh, this, you know, a couple weeks ago when you were competing, it was great to be down there to to talk with the anglers and, you know, uh, kind of share what the Bash University is all about. But I'd be lying if I said that wasn't a little bit of the kick in the pride uh, to be there working and not fishing. So, uh, mm. yeah, you, you can bet that, you know, next year I'm going to want to be in the dance. I'm not going to want to be on the sidelines. So, <laughs> I love that. I love that. I, uh, I, I felt the same way when I, I had to work my first classic and, <laughs> you know, I made, I made the classic and then I had to work it the next year. And it was, it was like, oh my God, I just got to get back into that championship tournament again. And, uh, and I know you, you would have done it this year had you fished through the full season. So, uh, we, we'll, we'll look for some big things, uh, from you, you know, in, in the next season, maybe BTC will come along and fish with us a little bit. What do you think, man? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> I know where I make my money and where I lose my money. So <laughs> fish is uh, expensive. For me. Oh man. Well, you know, I tell you what the BF, the BFLs are a, a reasonable expense compared to some of the other tournament trails out there. And, um, th that much I, you know, I appreciate it. It's funny just on a sidebar. Like I fished the opens, listen to this. I fished the opens and I fished the BFLs did pretty good in, in both. And my profit margin was extremely way higher in the BFLs than it was in the opens or the Toyota series. Just there you go. How about so, it? How, how about it? How you like and, them you know, apples? <laughs> <laughs> have have some of that but uh hey, what's going, what what uh i wanted to ask rich i didn't get a chance to talk to you i know you fished on the river yesterday uh what went down um you know pete it was uh typical delaware river fashion uh you know for me and what we've all experienced in the you know here today gone tomorrow type of scenarios as far as the size is concerned uh Mm -hmm. Caught a lot of fish, you know, had a limit early, quick in the morning. Um, but those uh, those bigger fish kind of kind of fleed the area for me uh, anyway. Um, you know, there was a, a there, there was a, a really strong Delaware River bag weighed in by one of our uh, good buddies, Keith Cowan, uh, put together almost a 14 pound bag uh, by really running and gunning all over that river to uh, to make it happen. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, things didn't really shake out for me in the event, but, uh, fishing's all about learning and adapting to, uh, to the, to the scenarios and current conditions. And we'll, uh, we'll get back out there and figure them out before the season's uh, over. Well, I know you will. And shout out to Keith, man. What a bag. And I know he does at this time of year, especially, man, he's a killer out there on that river, getting those big bags when, when the fall comes on. Luckiest guy yeah. I know. <laughs> no, Keith is D Keith is damn good. He just is. He doesn't fish out there much. He complains the whole time, and uh, he fishes it three times a year and, and wins two of them. You know, and and uh, no, he 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 catches them, man. He just I don't know. He's got a knack. Some people got it. Yeah, yeah, good. yeah. yeah he, he sure does. And you were you were active. You were you you were chunking big yeah, giant on the other side of winning. Baits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now for something different. <laughs> for something completely different well, now for something completely different <laughs> that's right uh, yeah i fished uh, i fished with keith thomas if you guys watched the show uh two weeks ago uh the big bait show we had he's he's a buddy from pennsylvania and i fished with him in, in a in an open and uh or actually it was a championship event and his son who he usually fishes with had to work uh so keith rang me up i jumped in there with him and uh it was just, you know, it's funny to see how good the river fished um, because I know the big reservoirs, uh, I know at least three of them that had events over the weekend fished really, really, really tough. You know, the, the, the high pressure, the barometric pressure rising up and 
whatever other conditions, it was just tough, man. They were they were they were hitting funny. Yeah, well, I mean that's bold though. I love that you know swing for the bleacher strategy that you you guys went after that day, and uh, um, yeah, that's, that's that was mostly that's a bold him. Way to go after term. Yeah, you know? I mean that was him. He was throwing the big bait in front of me, and I was relegated to a stupid Senko behind him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we you, saw wait, some wait, giants, wait. man. We saw some giants. About you, six, you about six or seven. Those? What's that? You have Cinco's? Dude, I got a ton of Don't Cinco's. Don't let Brian fool you. All right, I'm going to air this wait, wait, out wait. right now, all right? Go, bring, go it, ahead. bring it, Riz. Don't, don't let... It. I have a picture of what happens to Brian Cinco's. I'm pretty sure I can... Yeah, because that's a giant up. box full of Cinco's. That's like my third box. <laughs> this is what happens to Cinco's when they don't get used. <laughs> oh, they get crusty. Yeah, the, you know, all the salt jumps out of the yeah. Senkos and into the bottom of the box. Right. So, PTC, when you're throwing a Senko, it's a saltless Senko. Well, that's that's they're the bad colors. That's, that's, they're that's in like that the, box. That's and, like the B team. That's, the, that's yeah. the, the ones that don't get pulled out of there. But don't let Brian fool you, all right? This guy will he, – you'll he'll pick up a Senko, I, and you'll throw a Senko. I've seen it happen. I try I was out to. there on Mike's Lake. We were fishing before a live show. We probably made the live show late because we were fishing, and I'm out there throwing a frog, and he's waxing me on a Texas rigged Senko. Right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. I don't like it. You know what I mean? I definitely, I, I know that it set fishing back on its head at least <laughs> 20 years, you know? And, um, but, but, but anyhow. Well, I just, you know, some of you guys may know this, but I finally found a use for my drop shot rod. Um, and <laughs> hand it to your guide it client. Was, <laughs> it, it, was, it, it was it was on water training trip that took place yesterday, and uh, the um, you know the conditions were such that we one of the guys threw a drop shot, so likes to throw a drop shot. So I, I gave him the drop shot rod, which you know I had to unwrap it from the package. It was <laughs> in. And, um, yeah, we uh. We ran into some tricky situations, and uh, and he went he went head over heels right into the Upper Chesapeake Bay, <laughs> and, uh, what? and 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 my drop shot rod went in with him, and there it lies on the bottom of the Chesapeake Bay. So I finally have your client <laughs> for the rod. <laughs> we were able to rescue him uh, okay. and get him back in the boat uh, easily. It was we're all we're all you know we we laughed about it after the fact, but it was a little little sketchy there but uh so anyway i have no more drop shot no more drop shot rods so uh i guess as it should be for me. <laughs> 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 we have something in common pete i uh both my drop shot rods i had two uh they're on the bottom of my favorite point on lake hartwell so we've got something in common <laughs> we, we don't have drop shot oh. rods <laughs> <laughs> uh did you kick them in did you fall in oh dude we weren't running we i wasn't fishing i uh i'm the idiot i uh, was spot locked down because i was on a group of fish and uh i needed a i needed a rod that wasn't out and of course there was like 15 rods on top of my rod locker and i didn't want to move all 15 real quick that you know it takes five extra seconds and I thought maybe they'll just kind of just do the whole. They they usually do. Uh, yeah, they usually yeah, do. Yeah, they're <laughs> kind of turn over. But no, I knocked six of them in. Uh, <laughs> I put half my body, half my body in the water, got four back, and there went my favorite rod combo that won me the All American. Oh Helped no! The regional, mm. you know, it was a Revo MGX, like the Japanese version. So it was like a. It was like a six hundred dollar combo, oh, <laughs> and no. she's gone. She's gone. She was so smooth, man. I caught so many good fish on that rod, and wow. don't have it. man. That's well, me. I'm glad my well, fish aren't here yet because they'd be ribbing me because they know that's just common. <laughs> Here's a quick way to 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 not have that happen, and I picked it up. <laughs> I picked it up from Ike. You just grab all your rods right in the center. Just, just, just like gorilla grip them, put them into a cluster and forty-five them in front of your forty-five degree angle in front of your rod box. Pull your rod box open, grab the rod you need out, grab them in the same spot you grabbed them before, and just 
put them right back into that spot. But it's the fastest way I've found them, not moving them to the center of the boat. Just grab them all right in the center, 45-degree angle in front of the box, grab what you need, slide them back on. My, my rods would become so entangled, I would spend the, the <laughs> next seven hours of the tournament trying to get them all done. But Mike, nope. Like you said, Pete, he just like – Somehow, just like ah, angrily shake it, and the other ones just jump off. They, they, they're like, "Oh Christ, Mike's getting mad at this. We better, we better untangle." We'll end up broken or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. You're right, BTC. They're scared, man. They they, they won't hang up on purpose. I don't know how he does it, man. I've seen it. He'll grab the he'll grab the drop shot rod with the leader wrapped around all the others on the bottom of the pile, and somehow it's, it comes out on uh, uh, <laughs> and it comes out. Yep, and he still gets a cast off before me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hey guys, uh, if you're not a subscriber to Bashy, we met so many people that are at the BFLs this year. I'm so uh, thankful and proud to see you guys wearing the Bashy colors out there. Amazing deal going on right now. Thirty five dollars for a three month subscription. And we give you a $25 tackle warehouse coupon, go get yourself signed up, give it a try. Now's the time to study up. Uh, it's, it's the season. So get yourself subscribed to Bashu TV. And we're going to give you guys a lot of great prizes tonight. Riz, what do we got going on? That's right. As always, Pete, we, uh, we got some awesome prize packs going out the door from our awesome sponsors at the Bash university. Uh, for some questions tonight, there's going to be $25 gills gear, uh, gift cards, uh, getting sent out. Um, also, there's going to be a grand prize uh, at the end of the show. That's going to be a Ken Duke trivia question. Oh, we uh, have we're, several. We're we're bringing we're bringing that back out tonight for the big guns. That's going to be a hundred dollar pack. And uh, also, there's going to be a Facebook like and share as well uh, for a fifty dollar prize pack. So if you're over there watching on Facebook, we're going to take care of you too. Be sure to like and share tonight's feed, and you'll be entered in for a chance to win. But guys, really, the juice is going to be getting your questions on the show and getting a chance to win that grand prize at the end. And right now is a great time to sign up. Only $35, you get three months to Bash University TV. That's over 900 videos, all with one goal in mind, to help you catch more big bass. And when you sign up right now, we're giving you a $25 Tackle Warehouse gift card for signing up, guys. So we're giving you the content. We're giving you the Tackle Warehouse gift card. We want to help you catch more fish. Come on over. Join the family. Awesome. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. Stay tuned. We've got a trio of All-American qualifiers that are going to be uh, talking smack, how they did it, where they did it, uh, and, of course, we'll be able to ask them any questions we want to. So uh, come back with us. We'll be right back right after this, uh, unless BTC, what do you got? <laughs> and we also have, right after them, Daniel Fennell, the director of the BFLs, coming on. Big guest. Absolutely. Yes. And, uh, yes, sir. He will be, you will be talking about next year's schedules and all the other great stuff that it's coming down the pipe. Yeah. There's uh, so many people that participate in the BFLs. And uh, so we'll be talking with Daniel uh, shortly there after that. So hang in there with us. We'll be right back after this. Aquaview, the leader in underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for, catch more fish, have more fun. Aquaview, seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fish and rods? I'm truly losing less fish. It is the sensitivity of the rod. That are made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick. Every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out doing a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming Series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod I found that can withstand my hook set. Boom goes the dynamite. We're different. Some would say obsessed. There's no place on earth we'd rather be than right here, right now. Performance-driven gear, so you can fish longer, harder, 
Gills Performance Fishing. Guys, 2021 Red Crest Champion Dustin Connell here. And if you watch live coverage, we just got done at Lake Eufaula. I caught my fish using the active target with Lawrence. What you didn't see is I run a sea clear power harness in my boat. One of the main advantages to running this harness is it does not drain my batteries down at all running my four units. And what that's gonna allow me to do is I'm able to see my bait at 8 a.m. just as good late in the day. Y'all check them out at seaclearpower.com. Hey everybody, welcome back to Bass University Live. And uh, what, what an exciting night. Uh, the Bassin family has done well this year. They've all participated in, uh, in the Bass Fishing League over at Major League Fishing. And we have, uh, we have a bunch of qualifiers for the All-American. And um, it's pretty impressive because a lot of guys have been fishing the BFLs uh, for a long time and not had the opportunity to qualify and not made it. Um, it, it's, it's really an impressive accomplishment. We were talking about it a little bit earlier. The winners of the all American have gone on to greatness, uh, fame in the, in the bass fishing world. It's some of the who's who in bass fishing. And this is where a lot of them did it, where a lot of them got their first major win is here at the all American. So, uh, so let me introduce these guys. A lot of, you know, Justin Kimball, JK professional fish head. He's going to the all American this year. And, and JK, I'm going to, I'm going to read some of your stats. Uh, he's got seven BFL wins, one of which was this year, including three top tens this year to get him in to the divisional as a boater and is just really had a tremendous win this year. So proud of him. And, um, and there's a lot of other notes here that I'm not used something about a lucky horseshoe sideways stuck somewhere. Um, <laughs> has a local reputation, but he's a tremendous angler and, and wins a lot, has won a lot as a co decided fish boater this year. And is just tearing it up his team tournament partner, his buddy, uh, Matt Henry is, uh, you know, just a bit third in the points this year, two BFL wins, 14 top tens, three of which came this year and, uh, and is, and made it to the all American. Matt, it's great to have you with us tonight. Pete. And uh, and then we've got our boy, Alabama Mike Reed, who's been with us at, at all the Bassmaster Classics. A lot of you guys might recognize him. He's a big, smiling, uh, southern draw, of, you know, guy that's just so happy to be around. Always a great attitude. I love that about you, Mike. And, man, what a great year. Five, five uh, what is this, five out of 19 top tens? Oh, in thanks, DFL Pete. Conference. I really pretty all fuss, cuss, and disgust. This, that, and the third. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. What is what is that? Nineteen top tens, Mike? Is that right? No, he's only fished nineteen BFLs, and five are top tens. Yeah. Uh, five. That's pretty. That's those are pretty good stats, man. That's the top, and um, twentieth in the points in the Cowboy Division, and almost won a Bassmaster Open. He's no stranger uh, to being in the winner's circle and around it. And is going to the uh, going to the All American. So congratulations, Mike. Hey, thank you, Pete. It's uh, it's been a blessing this year. You know, it's my first year fishing the Texas Division. Um, and let me tell you something. I fished all over this country. Uh, um, you got to bring it in Texas, man. Uh, <laughs> it's just I, I've never fished a BFL that you know. The very first one we showed up to, I think, had like two hundred and sixty boats in it or something. It was ridiculous um Holy but i mean that's every tournament in texas right well uh, you know and we get that most of our subscribers that are watching and listening to us right now are from texas uh texas is is one of the bass fishing capitals of the world and and it's a testament to you man because you're out of your element you know what i mean you you're you fish all over the country and to be able to be su successful in that part of the country which you weren't that familiar with man that was a job well done well Thank you. I, you know, Bass U, man, is, is a big player in that, you know. I, I spent a lot of time I spent a lot of time learning from the guys that do well down here, you know. And even if it's not a technique, and I'll tell you that, you know, the subscribers out there, you don't have to, like, if I plan on doing a technique, I don't necessarily watch only the shows that talk about that technique. I watch the guys that, like, grew up on those lakes. And they don't care what technique they're talking about and just get the you can get the little nuggets, you know, mm -hmm. from, 
from, from the guys that come from these areas and fish lakes like that. And I really pick up a lot of stuff that way. You, mm. you know, they let little secrets out that they almost don't want to talk about in different seminars. You know what I mean? And I can put the, I can add them all together. Yeah. Mike? I heard that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's funny you say that because Jeff Olson, our 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 production head of production over here, is uh, was just listening to Brian Latimer. Uh, Jeff just moved our production studios down to South Carolina on the banks of Lake Hartwell, and uh, and he's learning how to fish Lake Hartwell, and he's studying BLATS uh, seminars from Lake Hartwell, and him and his wife both are. <laughs> are watching the videos they want to they can't wait to to become better fishermen on lake hartwell so it's interesting that you say that because i think a lot of people uh do that you know follow their local angler or their favorite angler and we have met bash you know no matter where you live we've got guys that specialize in that part of the country and uh but it but it's great it, it man it's it's so awesome that you made it and i uh, can't wait to cheer for you and i i gotta be honest uh, one of one of the funnest parts of um my day when i'm not fishing is following the updates from guys on the, that i know are fishing like jk uh will give updates sometimes riz will btc will sometimes and uh and i was getting updates uh from you jk uh throughout the the, the week down there and it was just it was amazing man it was it was so awesome to watch your weights get cold and and move up and up and up man what what a what a great ride you started out you crushed them and uh and and basically you you did what you needed to do to 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 make it in man that was a great week yeah thank you man it was uh just this whole experience you know was 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 testing you know it was very challenging week you know um i'd been to the st john's maybe three times and to, to go there and accomplish the goal of, you know, being an all, uh, all American was, uh, it was just a dream come true, you know, being there, experiencing it, having success, winning it as a co-angler is one thing, but with, you know, the MPFL on my plate, you know, next year. And, you know, I'm, I'm not like you, I don't have all this tournament experience. I get to fish maybe one tournament a year that requires a whole, you know, full three to four day practice ahead of it, you know, and it's a multi-day event. And to, to go do that and have success is just a big shot in the arm of confidence, you know, that as it, sh as it should be, you know, so it, it, it was a, it was an awesome, awesome week. And I learned so much, you know, I can't wait to go on another title fishery. You know, I really can't. <laughs> well, you were on the amazing one and Jack and Giants, <laughs> and it was so cool to see those pictures, man. And uh, and Matt, Matt, uh, you know, we we don't know each other very well. I know you mainly uh, through Justin, and uh, and it's awesome, you know, talking about the buddy tournaments that you fish. And uh, and it was, I'm watching, I'm watching the way in progress, and I'm watching you hold on to to tenth place on day two, you know, mm -hmm. and and the way ins concluding. And, and I and I know Justin's got a bag, so he's gonna he's going to threaten. I'm like, Oh man, you know, we got, we got to get Matt in there. And, and you yep. did, you, you qualified in the 12th place and it was really cool to, to see you do that. And mm -hmm. then you come in with just a monster stringer of fish on the last day. What a clutch <laughs> performance, man. Congratulations on that. I appreciate it. That was, that was a special day for sure. Um, has uh, made it even more special to be able to, to make it uh, with my, with my longtime team partner and one of my best friends, you know, it's just, it's been, uh, trying to make that all American. It, it's been one of a very, very difficult task for me. It seems like I've always had roadblocks and things go wrong. And, and I honestly, I was very upset on day two. I had, I've had missed opportunities on day one and day two. And, and, uh, I, the demons started creeping in again. I, I really thought that, you know, <laughs> we're going to miss it by a couple ounces that we were, Last time we were at the St. John's River was in 2018, and and I got on a similar deal down there in 2018, and I missed the final day cut by it was either two ounces or four ounces, and yeah. riding back into weigh in on uh, day two this time, I, I I was like I'm gonna be a fish short. It's just gonna happen once again, and 
it was a grueling hour, hour and a half sitting in the truck in the parking lot, watching the weights. <laughs> And then I can't imagine. adding it up and knowing that I was like, I know Justin's going to have them. I know, you know, this guy's going to have them. And the whole deal, I was looking, I was like, man, if anybody hops me, I'm done, you know, and, and, uh, you know, Lord, Lord willing, it, it happened. And uh, so we, we got to go play. Man, with a 26 pound stringer on the last day, man, that's, that's, that's an amazing stringer. What was that? Like the third biggest bag of the week. That was huge. It was, and and that's that's a career bag for me so far. I've I've uh, I've never experienced uh, being able to put it together and having one of those perfect days and those clean days. And and uh, I, I knew I was around the right fish because on day one and day two, yeah, I really should have been somewhere over 20 pounds each day. Um, lost fish plagued me on both of those days, and and uh, I made an adjustment on on the final day. I mean, it, it's a lot easier when. You know, when you go out and you know you're in 12th place, you know only top 12 fishes. You know you can't finish but worse than 12th place. You know it's so there. Some of the pressure was taken off of me a little bit there, and I was 20 pounds behind the leader, um, and and I really just needed to go out there and have fun. You know, put the enjoyment back into it, go fishing, and and uh, I made an adjustment. I looked at the tide charts and at the pretty much at the last minute, and I threw a. a audible in you know my game plan i just i just knew that i needed to make an adjustment and change and and boy did that pay off because the the first five fish i put in the boat were the five fish that i weighed in and and uh it, it went down quick and and uh what? everything went right the first five fish you caught weighed 26 pounds that's right <laughs> project this let's talk about the bag it catches a five pounder then a seven pound ten ounce then a sinker, then another four pounder. <laughs> Those were the five. Yeah. Just Talk about time in the tide, right, man? Holy crap! <laughs> you, you made a little adjustment there, and I, I think you hit the nail directly on the head. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that, that was uh, that was a decision that uh, best decision I've ever made in fishing, obviously, and and uh, to be able to make a comeback like that, it, it was incredible. I mean, just a. Uh, you know, and it wasn't that I was catching multiple fish in, in the same spot. It was literally I was I was hopping hopping spots. And and what was neat about it was that, you know, I, I started realizing what to do and what was going on and and to be able to time that tide right. You know, I hit my first place right on the tide and I knew that to chase that tide, if I started moving down the river, uh, little short hops at a time, I'd be hitting those places at the exact right time as well. And, and as I did that, you know, every single place I hopped on, it was, it was a big one. And um, I had some other opportunities that, that just missed. I didn't lose any fish that day. I fished clean. And, and obviously it's, you know, it's amazing what happens when you fish clean and to see the, see the results. But um, I did have a few fish that missed me. And, and, um, and so there were some other fish that, that possibly could have made a bigger bag there, but uh you know, just, just timing that tide and being able to make the adjustments. I was fishing new water. Like I, the, the first place I fished was actually a place that, that I was catching them. But after that, the next four stops were new water uh, that I had not fished in the tournament, but they mm -hmm. made sense because of the tide and what was going on. And, and I just hit everything just right. And, and, uh, you know, just it's hard sometimes to throw down what you're doing, you know, throughout the tournament, especially when you've got the opportunities and know it lives in other areas. But, you know, I just felt like I was just going to be making a bad decision if I went and fished, a, fished some of these areas on a marginal or a bad tide. And it, it all worked out. Man, that's that's great. I love that. Uh, never take practice out of your tournament. That's that's been a mantra. Uh, John Sokol, uh, it's kind of burned. I've been using it all year and it's helped me tremendously help you fishing you know new water was that so that was your adjustment was to to run the tide was it was it a, a current like the, the tide had to be high low or what what was the adjustment i pretty much tried to run the tide every day um i just hit it right like i under i figured out where i needed to be and and the main thing was having current um when i when when you were on a turnaround tide and the tide started you know, going slack, it made it really difficult. And and to be honest with you too, there were some other areas that, you know, I had a lot of places to fish on the river. It wasn't just, you know, uh, 
you know, one thing in particular, there were certain places that, you know, were better at the high tides and certain places that were better on a little bit lower tide. And, and uh, it, it just depended on the depth of the water in some of these locations. And, um, but, but the main thing was, you know, when I started looking, I mean, we were making some long runs on these first couple of days, we were making some long runs. I mean, we were worried about getting back with fuel um, on some of these. And, and uh, I, I decided when I started looking at the tide charts, the place that like on day two, I lost two fish that were about five pounds each and I lost one about six to seven. And, uh, and those were a, a long ways, you know, out of the way, long ways up. And I started looking at things and, and I, I wanted to go right back there. I knew what lived there. I, I saw what lived there and these fish weren't alone. And I really, really, really wanted to go do that. That was my plan. When I went to bed that night, the night before, I'm, I'm going to straight back to these fish that I know. But when I woke up that morning, I looked at the tide chart and I was looking, I was like, why am I going to do that? It doesn't make any sense. Well, I'm going to be hitting it on a turnaround which, you know, is going to be a marginal tide for what's going to go there. And I, if I get up there all the way to the limits of what I can make to make it back on the same tank of fuel, I'm not going to be able to really follow it down. If I follow it down, I'm going to be hitting all the other places on the wrong tide as well. And it was just going to throw me out of sync for the whole day. And so what I realized was that if I, if I started close, you know, and basically I started really close to the ramp, um, on that final day and then tried to put myself the goal was to put myself in position by catching a few fish so that then I could go run to the other stuff and hit it once that tide had turned around and I could really just make mm -hmm. it happen you know and hit both areas at the right tides and set myself up for success but I ended up you know I caught a bunch of fish throughout the day when I did do that but um, you know everything happened first thing that morning because I hit it on a feeding period I hit it on the right tide. I hit, you know, and I, and I was landing every time I made a move, I was moving a half mile at a time and I was just hitting it at the exact same point in time. So it just all worked out. Man, that's awesome. So people, JK, people said, I've heard them, uh, tides don't matter on, on the, uh, the, that river down in Florida. Doesn't have a big enough tide swing. Doesn't matter. But look, you know, you know different, don't you? Yeah, it, it, it mattered big time, man. I, uh, you know, I, first off, and I think Mike would agree with me here, knowing Matt for so long, count, count me and Mike as two guys not surprised at what Matt did on the final day. This We're talking a guy who won his first BFL. I think it, it was his first one where he was 11 pounds back in a two day, you know, and then busting him and, and coming back on the lead. You know, he talked about being 20 pounds back. Well, he closed the gap. He only, he was only about six or no, excuse me, five and a half pounds back when it was all said and done. So you're talking about, you know, one or two fish that he had on, you know, on, you know, he got the bites to win this tournament. Super proud of him for, for locking in and, and trusting his, his gut to follow the tides. Cause, cause I, I got it right on day one with the tides. Um, and that was because I, I, I ran that bass cat all over the place the the range from the southernmost fish to the northernmost fish i figured was over 40 miles that i caught on day one and uh, i figured we, we kind of figured this out together but obviously i've done a lot with bash U. the only the only way i know how to even consider tides is because i've spent time in the boat with pete glusek on the james river you know, and the fact that I've been in the classroom for so many title seminars, Mike Iaconelli, Pete Glusek, JT Kenny, guys, there's no joke. You know, the biggest thing that stood out to me, too, <clears throat> was a reminder on. Sure, there's tides that we'll all agree most of the, most of the season fishing season. A lot of times it's going to say, hey, you know, that outgoing tide's going to be the best. Low tide can be great, you know, positions the fish and all that stuff. And that's great. But what we were seeing was when we had the current and the strongest tides, it didn't matter incoming or outgoing. It turned the, it turned the activity on. Those fish started swimming. The bait started swimming. Those fish started eating. And, uh, you know, day one, I, uh, I made a decision to, to leave some, some uh 
some territory that, uh, you know, I was confident in and stretch my range further than I had really fished in practice. And I, I tried to t put practice into the tournament again, Pete, from the get go, you know, and I, ex I expanded my range to where I felt confident to catch a fish just south of Palatka, maybe even down to Wheelacka, all the way north of Jacksonville, you know, and the magic you know, let's go X's and O's real quick. You know, we can talk about the fun that we had, the fun, the fact that Matt caught a giant bag on top water, the fact that every fish that I weighed in was top water. Man, that was fun, right? That, well, that never happens. I mean, in the entire <laughs> tournament, two qualifiers, I, I don't think either one of you weighed a fish on anything other than a top water that week. Well, the winner won it on a frog, Pete. <laughs> you know, the, the, the guys who just blew top water in their hand had some success. You know, and there's some guys who were flipping and stuff who got in that top top six, you know. Um, you know, Crosno, everybody knows him. He's a great flipper. He's gonna seek that out. And he's won down there. I think he did he win the last regional down there, Matt? Crosno? No, Troy Troy Morrow won the last one. Okay, I think Crosno won the one before uh Troy back in like 16 because I think Wes Logan had like an 11 pound lead and Crosno ran him down yeah. um but uh but yeah so there were the, you know it, everybody was fishing their strength honestly because we know David Lowry he won a magical week we we know him and he he was we know he was fishing his strength Crosno was got to the All-American fishing his strength you know, and Matt and I, when we when we can, we we would prefer to throw anything on top. I think Mike Reed's in, on that team too. You know, big fish bite top water in the fall, but sometimes you you go home a zero. Even though I can't get a top water bite up here in Arkansas, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't well, get a top water bite all week. I mean, Awachita is a top water lake. I mean, everybody <laughs> knows it is. I mean, it's like it's no secret. It's like a buzz bait whopper whopper capital of the world. Yep. Yeah, it is. Oh, right. I mean, like every professional tournament ever fished there was one on the top, you know, <laughs> you know, and, uh, man, I, I tell you, I just, I went. Mike's getting, a, is, he, is he getting frozen on your end too? Yeah. Guy? yeah, I'm losing Mike a bit, but back to the, back to where like the current played such a big deal. You know, I, I had to learn as I go. I had to learn as the tournament goes on and sometimes I'd get it wrong and I'd have to run six or seven miles North or South to get, try to get back on the right tide, you know, and, and sooner or later you'd run into it. Um, but the magic was this and, you know, sorry, Matt, this is the Bash university, so we're going to give it up, but, when the further north I went, I didn't expect to find big populations of fish. You could find populations of fish in the creeks, and they 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 played. I felt like they they were on a different tide for like when the fish bit, and the tide wasn't good, you know, for that um, for the for the tournament that we got. So running that that main lake deal or main river deal, you had to have. The, the biggest, this is where Lake Master was so awesome for me because I could look at it and be like, they're going to, I'm going to be able to catch them there, 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 and there. The, the, the shallowest water, flat or point, that could stick out the furthest off the bank. Like the, you know, we were making long idols up to the bank. The fish would be right up on the bank. You could catch fish on docks if they were there. And they would be out, but any dock fish I felt like you caught was inactive. If you were going to go catch a fish on a moving bait, in our case, the top water, they'd be glued to the bank on the right tide and they would crush it. Well, you'd have to idle 100 to 300 yards. Well, more than 100 yards. You'd have to idle 300 yards sometimes, two to 300, just to get your boat in position to make a cast because there's that much flat water between you and the fish, you know? So we, we did a number on the bottom of our boats. Matt's still too scared to look at the bottom of his boat. <laughs> I've got some fiberglass work to do, you know, cause that, that's not a safe place for fiberglass boats. It's, Those hur hurricanes that came through back in like 2017, 2018, 
they tore up some docks and like it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you're on a stretch that has no docks on it there are dock pilings laid on the bottom laid over sideways that are covered in barnacles sounds barnacles. Pretty, yeah. pretty familiar it to is a river we fish awful. Pete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Yep. We, we, we get the barnacles too, but, uh, yeah, I know where you got, I couldn't believe that you guys were fishing for Florida bass around barnacles. I mean, it's, it, it, it's such an unusual, uh, occurrence. How Usually much? The, Flo the, the Floridas are up in the muck, man. They're up in the pads and the, you yeah, know, they're not down around that salt water, but they were for you guys. How well, much of an effect does it have? on the bass on the St. John's River because you said something to me, Justin, a couple times this week that really stuck out, and that was that if they go too far from those docks, they're getting eaten by a shark or they're getting eaten oh. by a snook. Or <laughs> How much does that affect the way these bass set up and live and feed for the simple fact that they're not the apex predator? Every, every time I go fishing and my boat goes in the water, I'm fishing for bass. Most likely, that's the apex predator in the area that I'm fishing. Exactly. On the St. John's, it's not. How does that yeah. like? How does that factor in? Yeah, the further up you go, the further upriver, which is south, the further south you go, they they become the apex predator, right? They can get offshore. You hear about the shell beds and yep. stuff. The you know the but up by you, Jacksonville, <laughs> I've seen what swims in that river. Jacksonville, the moment you cross under the bridge, it's a different fishery. Right there by Palaka, it opens up immediately. You know, because right south of Palaka, it starts to turn and starts to narrow up. Well, once you get that wide open water, you get Jack Cravels. You can catch a snook, redfish. There's tarpon you're seeing. Um, there's sharks available. <laughs> but the thing is, the further you go to Jacksonville, guess what? The more of that stuff there is. So they get glued to the bank or glued to a dock post. They are tight to cover. And they're not everywhere. This isn't something we could just run every bank and you know we had to figure out the types of areas these fish were using and the reason i liked these mass expanses of shallow water shallow flat water was because in my opinion it gave them more safety from predators it gave me a bigger potential to get a population of bass even if that population was seven for that 200 yard stretch that was enough for me because guess what i could go up there I could cast at the bank, and if I got the tide right, I could cast at the bank for 200 yards, and I'd get one to blow up, you know, because they, they'd be there. Yeah, and they have, I, lo and they I like have, that. They have to eat. You know, there's they were they were eating finger mullet, which is why the top water weren't so good. Um, they were eating shrimp and crabs. All three of those were spit up in my live wells. That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> I, 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 I've seen that down at the Mobile Delta where the, the freshwater – gets the the mixing is so close together where the fresh and salt water can come together and i think the saint john's is similar that way and they're up there eating all that that salt water uh bait fish which is amazing but you, what you haven't talked about top water what what how how were you catching these fish so i'll let matt go in a sec but i i figured something out you know i I tied on, well, when I figured out the top water thing, I was dock fishing because I actually found a creek that was loaded. That creek was north of Jacksonville and it was, it was loaded and I needed a reason to, to at least go up there. Even if I only fished in Palaka, you know, if I could find a pattern in Palaka and then run up there, I would have been happy, you know? And so I kind of put in kind of halfway between Palaka and the next bridge and started uh, poking around and I'm out there flipping a dock in the morning and I, you know, not really looking at top water. I got it tied on, but all these redfish come up schooling, right? Pushing finger mullet up on a reed line on a really shallow point next to me. Well, I go over there, I throw a cane walker, that new cane walker 110, just cause that's what I had tied on from Lake Lanier and throw it up there and boom, here we go, baby. We got a redfish on. Nope. Four and a half pound largemouth. <laughs> Light bulb went off. Two weeks prior, I was on a short family vacation down to the panhandle, and I met up with a buddy who took me red fishing. We threw top water all day long. We caught six redfish and 25 bass. 
What I remembered was the bass were so tight to those reed lines that you'd never catch them six feet off the bank. But six feet off the bank, you'd catch the redfish, you'd catch the snook and all that stuff. But it showed me that, hey, there's bass that live amongst these things. It gave me a confidence to start running and then to start running north. I took my hooks off, got a few bites. I identified them as bass, and I said, man, we are going to go burn gas today in practice, and that's all I did. And I just started marking stuff on my Lake Master, kind of got a view, because it didn't matter about the type of cover. It could have been a reed line. The reed lines were great. Cypress trees were great. You know, they've got those knees in front of them, so it kind of gives them extra cover, you know, right up on the bank. The seawalls were great. Um, and it, what, what we figured out is it, it really didn't matter. As long as there was a hard line, a hard edge for them to bust the finger mullet, mullet up on, and you had that ingredients of all that shallow water out in front, that long point, that long flat, magic. You know? what, what, now you chose a, a, a walking bait over a, a whopper plopper or a chugger bait or, or what, what was that clearly the choice? I mean, would they not strike the other baits? So I tried everything else, right? So the confidence was the fact that my buddy who took me red fishing throws that thing 12 months out of the year. His name's Tony. He's an awesome dude. He used to be a great bass fisherman, still is, but now he just fishes for redfish every year. And he throws a topwater all day long and he catches big bass while he catches redfish you know and i tried a plopper i tried a buzz bait i tried frogs matt got frog bites in practice i got zero frog frog bite at the st john this week frustrating because i wanted to make a frog bite work um and uh you know i could get bit on a jig and a wacky rig general around the dock posts um and around the docks but to me, I, I decided not to do that because those fish were more inactive and you had to really slow down. And I felt like once you got the tide right, those fish were, they need a whole cane walker, um, you know, and get three hooks down its throat. So I actually started do, throwing a lot of different brands. And for whatever reason, that sound, it's got like a hard knocking sound, but there's rattles with it and stuff. It just seemed like they really liked that sound. I don't know if it's really the same way with Matt. You know, we were sharing what we were catching on, catching them on, but I, I ran with it and I threw a chrome and bone, baby. That's it. <laughs> it was like I was out of here, you know? <laughs> was that, was that you too, Matt? Chrome and bone? Yeah, I had, uh, it's pretty much the same thing. It was mainly walking baits and, uh, I was throwing, um, I was throwing the bone flash and, and, uh, so I had some flash to it, but also had the bone color and, um, I was catching them on a gunfish. I was catching them on a spook. I caught some on on the, the cane walker. It, it's uh, it, it didn't seem to matter too much, but you know, um, the walking bait was just the main deal in my opinion. And and I think it's because they were they were glued to the mullet. And and uh, what was what was crazy? I mean, it, I saw multiple times throughout the week where i mean the, the finger mullet was the deal like if you found them on finger mullet that was the deal because that's that's where your populations of fish seem to be but the uh we were watching sometimes there was eight eight inch mullet that were getting you know absolutely destroyed against a reed line or getting destroyed against a cypress tree and they were jumping out of the water trying to get out of the way and you're watching these fish just absolutely beat the crap out of them on the sides of them and trying trying to get them and and it was just it was one of the most phenomenal things I've ever seen. Now, I, I had a clue going down there this time because in 2018, I found, basically, I figured out a similar deal. And uh, and so I had some execution issues in 2018. So I was really trying to figure out a frog bite uh, this time. I really thought if I could just get them hooked on a frog, I wouldn't lose them. Because usually when I hook them on that, that frog, it, it, they do knock them off. And and uh, this, this time, you know, I got some bites on the frogs and, but they were almost too aggressive. Like these, these fish were, were super aggressive. And, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, these were the loudest, uh, craziest, most aggressive topwater strikes I think I've ever encountered in my life. And yep. um, I mean, it sounded like somebody, you know, dumped a bunch of bowling balls out of a dump truck on top of them. I mean, that's, <laughs> and, and I think a lot of it's just because of how shallow they were. I mean, a lot of these fish, just like J Justin said, like, we were having to idle 
you know, a long ways to get to some of these fish. I mean, we're jack plates raised up, you know, motor up out of the water, trying to get there and we're trying to be quiet, but at the same time, like, you know, get, you know, be efficient with your time and uh, you get in there and they're all the way back up there on the bank. And they're, I mean, some of these fish, these are, you know, a lot of, what I thought was going to happen was that I was going to be catching a lot of three and four pounders. That was, that was kind of my take on it because of what I've experienced in the past. And I was so wrong. Like there's five, six, sevens all mixed in on this. And, and, me, and, <laughs> yeah, and me and Justin were talking about it like during practice because he was asking, is it going on? Is it going on? And and I was like, man, I really don't know because I haven't done it. Like, and, and we experienced a major cold front for Florida. Um, to, to start off, kick off our practice, I got down there on Saturday afternoon and I uh, got to spend a couple couple hours on the water and there was a major flipping bite going on that day. Like they were they were on the docks and things like that. And you could flip and catch them. And they were, I was getting frog bites. I mean, they were biting. Yeah, I was watching that night. On Saturday night, it got cold. And Florida fish do not like cold fronts. And it shut them down for days. I mean, you should have heard the dock talk, you know, around there <laughs> saying, you know, I mean, there were people leaving, you know, it's just, it was very, very difficult wow. to get bit. And and I'm I'm second guessing it. I'm like, man, it took 32 pounds to make the cut last time we were there. I'm like, okay, it's going to take 26, 27 pounds to make the cut this time. But I didn't practice a lot of what I, you know, a lot of this pattern. I didn't want to lose confidence in it. So I spent, because I thought I would only be around three and four pounders, I spent almost I would say probably 75 to 80 percent of my practice looking for kicker fish in different places, and that was gluing you know, flipping baits in my hand, and that was gluing frogs in my hand, and uh, and I did find a few places, and I actually never got to, I never even fished them, but um, I, I did that just looking for places that I might be able to. Once I had a maybe a 15, 16 pound limit, I could go call up, you know, and catch a kicker. And uh, it just never happened. You know, I never, never did that because I started seeing the potential. I was started catching four, four and a half. So I was jumping off fives. I was breaking off fish that honestly, when I first broke them off on the hook sets, I thought they were saltwater fish. I thought that they're Jack Crevel. I thought they were, and then they would start jumping with my topwater bait in their mouth and they're five, six pounders. And I literally watched one throw my bait. You know, it, it jumped four times with my bait in its mouth. I'm watching it. It's a knife to the heart every time it jumps. And all of a sudden, it throws the bait out of its mouth. The bait lands on the water, and I watch another five-pounder eat it. And oh, I, I mean, I had I waited around for five, ten minutes. I finally got my bait back. But um, big one, that one spit it. But, I mean, it's just, it was one of the most incredible times I've ever experienced. I do think, too, just, just one little tidbit. I know um, Justin talking about how these fish feel safe being up shallow and up on the bank and 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 i agree with that i think that there's so many different critters out there that can get after these things that that truly for a largemouth bass they like being on the bank they, they like being shallow if they can and that's going to be their safe area but we also were encountering a full moon and mm. on a full moon we were you know you're having the stronger tides which is the higher highs and the lower lows and uh and and it, for me not only was the 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 full moon a factor, but there's been a lot of rain in Florida this year, and certain parts of the river were higher than normal. Um, the salinity was actually down this year, like so because of the amount of fresh water that is entering the system. I think that right. was one thing that kind of allowed us to do what we did this year. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but, but the water was the water was higher. The, you know, there's a little bit more fresh water in some areas, and I, I think it allowed us to chase that bite and get up shallow because those fish were up shallower this year than, than normal and, and even further north than normal. That's interesting that you say that. We see that this year in, in our area, too. We got a, a big influx of fresh water uh, all over our rivers and, and bay systems, and our, our salt, you know, our, our, our salt water lines are going down and down this year. They didn't come up near as high as they normally do. That that's that's really cool and, and really great observation. Makes a lot of sense. Riz, let me throw it to you. We got some IMs for these guys. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, first IM question that I'm going to go with is from Bassin eight oh four, and Bassin eight oh four wants to know um, from J K and Matt. 
Uh, how much does the brackish water uh, influence affect the amount of bass that can be in one area? Does 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 the salt water influence limit the amount of bass that can live in one area, or does it seem to be um, you know the same as a completely freshwater environment? I'm going to let Matt take that one because as you heard him explain, he's a lot smarter than me. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 uh, we're, we're learning this, this, uh, title game together. So it's, uh, we don't have a lot of experience with that, but obviously, uh, there's a major population of fish in that river down there on the St. John's. And, and, and I believe, I believe what's happened this year is that, you know, I think the large population of fish like to be in the creeks up there when you get a lot of that brackish water or you get a lot of that, that salt kind of, you know, influence. I think a lot of those fish are going to want to be in the creeks. And I think, you know, because there's plenty of tidal creeks up there that actually have a lot of fresh water, you know, coming through them. I think that's where those fish live. I mean, when you look at the, in, in the past couple of years, the the elite series and, and some of these other tournaments that have been out there, you know, there has been some guys win that direction or, or do well that direction. It's just, they've been up in the creeks. And I think that the fact that we had fresh water, you know, a lot of fresh water this year, a lot of rain that influenced into the system, that it allowed a lot of those fish to venture out into some areas that maybe they're not normally there. I mean, we didn't have much fishing pressure around. And I think it's because it's, you know, we were fishing like we were catching redfish. Um, yep. But I think that, I think that there is a large population of fish. I just think that they, they, uh, we hit it at a weird time to where, you know, these fish actually were out on the river rather than in the creeks, you know, because they're, they're going to thrive and live in those creeks more times than not. You know, they're going to spawn in those creeks. They're going to do their, their whole early part of the year. That's what they're doing. Um, and I think, uh, too, we hit a perfect storm with seeing these big populations of fish that live in those creeks that ventured out because there was a shrimp run and there was a mullet run happening that was delayed. It would normally have started earlier on and, uh, and, and it drew them out there to, so they could gorge on that, that type of bait. So, um, but I, I think, I mean, you see in a lot of places, I mean, it, there's large populations in a lot of tidal fisheries, you know, I, I had to research a lot about tidal fisheries. You know, I was watching the, the seminar with JT, you know, uh, yeah, I was watching Ike's, you know, um, you know, seminar on, on tidal water, and I was trying to learn it there, and, and there's plenty of bass that live out there. What I think limits them when you're talking about saltwater is I feel like anytime you're in brackish or salt, I feel like it limits the size of what those fish can get. I think that you can have just as many fish out there around. I just, for me, it's kind of the mental block is that I didn't think there was going to be these big fish out there. I, I feel like when you get into salty type environments, you're going to see your population of, you know, of large fish kind of cap out around that three to four pound mark. And, uh, and, and we were wrong this year because uh, those big <laughs> ones made it out there. So. It, that's a great, you know, it's an interest. And I think that fresh water, I think your observation on the, the more fresh water in that system allowed those bigger fish to get further, uh, closer to Jacksonville than probably they do normally. Uh, you know, we see it down in other places it, it's it, there's a lot to learn here it's a great question uh by the viewer and you know we've had a study on the chesapeake here where uh smallmouth was caught in fresh water and uh and brought 20 miles through salt water uh to a weigh-in and tagged and he swam 20 miles through salt water to get back to his home <laughs> um wow you know so wow. so, so there, there, there's you know, fish will travel through it. They have tolerance for it to a certain extent. Down, down at the Mobile Delta, you know, I fished several tournaments down there, and um, the 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 saltwater bait congregates at the freshwater meeting line. It's where all the food is. So all the mm -hmm. bass really spend their lives in salt water, and it limits their growth. Uh, it, they they just can't live a long life. They can't spend too much time in the salt water. So uh, it's just such an anomaly, like you said, Matt. These giant fish are right there in the brackish zone, and it, it's it's not common to see that in my experience. And uh, it, it's really cool. I think I think that extra fresh water really helped drive that population around. But uh, man, great stuff. Catch them on top, guys. You want to go down? You want a top water fish? St. John's River. Get a frog. Get some top water bait. <laughs> Oh my God! I think we all we all got to go down there next October. You know, right? Let's put hey, some thirty pound leader on. 
<laughs> yeah. let's, let's, let's talk about the winner real quick. David Lowry's first stop. He caught a nine pounder, a seven pounder, and a five pounder. First stop of the tournament on a frog. <laughs> that, that, that's what that fishery offers, you know. And and I, Pete, I got to give a gift to our, our viewers out there because you gave me and Matt a gift on day one. Um, and I felt like we need to give it back. And you've probably said it in the seminar. Um, I, I can remember you saying it, but reiterating it to us. You know, here's what happened. Matt told you guys about the breakoffs, losing fish on the jump. I really wasn't losing fish on the jump, but like I said, I had nailed the tides earlier in the tournament. And so when I got bit, when you nailed the tides, those fish would inhale the bait. Yeah. There was no jumping and throwing your bait. You got three hooks of a cane walker down its gullet, you know. And man, honestly, the uh the the there was two times I didn't hit the tide right, but but a five or six pounder blew up on my bait. And I would come back two hours later or an hour later on the right tide and I caught their those fish. And that, I mean that felt good, but that reiterated, hey, this is just getting the tide right. Once you get the tide right, right, these fish are easier to catch. I want to you know? I want to just but, echo that and to JK and interrupt for a second because it reminds me of the great Aaron Martins when he was down here fishing the Chesapeake and the fish mm -hmm. were nipping at his chatterbait during a slack or a poor tide. And as the tide uh, got low, those fish connected. They stopped yeah. missing and they started connecting. And it's all about the, the right tide cycle. And I just, just want to give a shout out to Aaron Martins. We love you and we're thinking about you. And uh, it just yeah. reminded me exactly of that. Cause you're right, JK, that tides everything. It, it means between it's difference between a miss and a hookup, you know. Oh, but, hey, Pete, but, you know, you know, you know what I think was the the two key things that Matt said. Matt, you, you know, like dialing in the bait and dialing in the tide and all that's very important. But you said two things that punched your ticket to the All American, and the first one is you didn't want to practice when it was bad. You knew it was going to be bad, and you didn't want to ruin your confidence. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the number one. And the number two thing that you did is you didn't – you made the decision to fish new water on day three. Those are the two decisions that punch your ticket to the All-American. And, I mean, yeah. dude, that's so important. That's tournament fishing 101, you know. Like, we can know all the information and know all the, the – what we ought to be doing. And, you know, everybody needs to be throwing a white buzz bait and a whopper plopper and a wash the top. <laughs> but at the end of the day – you got, I mean, that you got to have the confidence and you got to, you got to make decisions and fish new water on tournament days. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and, and the other part of that too, and, and it's, it's not as visible or not, not as seen, but, uh, you know, obviously a 26 pound bag kind of overshadows things, but, you know, my lowest, my smallest bag of the week was 14.9 or 14.3 or whatever it was on day two. I caught every single one of those fish on new water on day two. And, and it was, I literally was just running, running a deal, trying to get back into the right zone. And, and it, it took, it, it took leaving my area and going to new water to catch those fish. But I never, re, I never got to revisit those fish. I didn't even get to go revisit those fish, even though there was big ones in there. I didn't, that's where I was going to go. And then I yeah. just completely changed directions on day three. And, and it and you off. have to, you have to, you have to play those conditions, you know, like, I, and it's the hardest thing to do in bass fishing. I really believe that. You know, it's easy. It's easy to say, Mike. It is the hardest thing in the world it's to the do. The hardest yeah. thing to do. Me and Justin talk about it all the time. I mean, Justin. Justin's like my uh, my mental coach. You know, like we talk about it constantly. Like I despise <laughs> practice. I hate it. Every time I have a good practice, and I go out there, and I'm gonna whack a thirty pound bag on Sam Rayburn, right? It, I I stink. You know, <laughs> but every time I don't practice or I just idle around and run and look at areas and, and, and you know, kind of figure out what's going on. And all right, I can see this. Hey, this this is the potential. This is the juice. I, I get it. There's 20 boats in here, but they're all going to give up on it today and not fish it tomorrow. And that's when I'm going to be in there. Right. Mm -hmm. 
And, uh, I mean, that stuff pays off. I mean, it's the mental game more than it is anything else. And, Mike, and I mean, I think – Yeah, you're right. It's between the ears, and it, people, people don't account for that. I mean, the exit – you know, you got to know your exit. You got to be tight. You even got to be good with a drop shot and a Senko, BTC. You got to be good with all <laughs> that stuff. But but between the ears can really separate you. And, Mike, let, let's take a turn, man. Let Take us to Lake Wachita, man. You had an hey. amazing tournament through an incredibly tough field in a water in waterway that you're not that familiar with, man. Congratulations. Justin. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Justin, did you have something real quick? Man, real quick, I wanted to follow up. I know I'm long-winded on, on, on that earlier. I want to get to watch talk. But real quick, Pete, I got to give our guys the gift I was talking about. Oh, yes. I, got, got, I got carried away, but here's <laughs> the deal. Um you know that the, the, the you talked about me being your mental coach. Pete's mine. Pete's my life fishing coach, and <laughs> and I had told him about the fish that we broke off. I broke off what I think was a legit ten plus pounder, maybe twelve. Um, you know, this fish acted like a snook. If she didn't try to come out of the water, I wouldn't have known she was a bass. I also broke off like a seven to eight early on day one. This is before I put my twenty one pound bag together, but. You know, we, we, we stuck with it. We had PMA. We can go into all the adversity and all that stuff through the tournament, whatever. I get a text after I told Pete kind of a synopsis of what happened in a text after weigh-in. He's, you know, pumped up for me or whatever, but he throws, interjects this in. Give me a call about those breakoffs if you get some time. And this was a key moment because he got to remind me of a lesson and he's already taught me you know i can remember this but i'm never on tidal water um and when you're around that those giant fish let's be honest matt those are the sharpest teeth i've ever seen in a bass my hands were absolutely cut up and uh they broke 40 pound braid like it was butter they put it on barnacles and pete gave me and matt i had matt on the phone too because he had break offs on day one we had him on speakerphone and he's sitting there saying guys 20, you know, you got to use a leader, but 20 will cut on those barnacles. 25 will cut on those barnacles. 30, you'll get some abrasion resistance with that 30. Matt just so happened to have 30 pound fluorocarbon. I, we bumped up the 50 and 65 pound braid, tied those uh, 30 pound fluorocarbon leaders on, and That's I never awesome. had to break off the rest of the tournament. Man. How did that affect the action of your bait? Dude, it didn't, Good. man. Cain Walker will freaking walk right. on. Because it's just so, it's so big a line. Floor. That thing is so easy. Also, it didn't matter because <laughs> all you had to do was throw it up on the bank. And if they didn't blow on it, blow up on it right away, you just had to go twitch, twitch, kaboom. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, you didn't need a lot of action. You just <laughs> needed, you needed the, the meat. It, it, it is crazy looking at it because the, uh, the breakoffs I had, you know, I actually got the bait back that I broke off on day one, and and I threw it down in the floor of the boat, didn't tie it back on because I had I had already tied on a couple since you know I was sitting there waiting on the fish to throw the bait. Um, I was I was uh, you know didn't even think about it. Well, I like to use a loop knot on a lot of my top waters just because of the you know getting the action and things like that. So I was using on some of my smaller top waters because I was trying to mimic the finger mullet. I wasn't using the big stuff, but I had a uh, I had a 40 pound braid to a 20 pound monofilament leader uh, on there. And, you know, I've never had a problem with that before. Like that's always been, been fine and good and had the loop knot. Well, it broke about half an inch above the loop knot and on, on, where, where I saw it. And so I was looking at it. And, and so I started checking my, my leaders, you know, on some of the other stuff, you know, the next couple of days after we had even upped some, I was started throwing 25, fluorocarbon leader on some of my smaller like my gun fishes and things like that but i was going on like the bigger baits the bigger spooks and things that were easier to walk i'd go to the 30 pound and call me crazy because you know i probably should have should have paid more attention to this but i ended up not retying one time on uh, that day of the 26 pound bag i didn't i never retied but <laughs> i kept feeling my my line above that loop knot every time I, you know i was still using a loop knot on it then and you can feel that exact spot half an inch above the knot. You can feel that area where it was getting, uh, I think it's the teeth. I, th I think it's the teeth yeah. from the fish. And I just think these are just absolutely insane 
monster <laughs> fish that are down there that are just eating. Because uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I've not experienced fish with teeth like that and had, having to worry about it. Yep. Well, that's yeah. interesting. I, and I know that about Florida strains, their teeth are, are a little bit more fierce than than your northern strain largemouth. We've, I've seen that. And uh, but but you know if you've watched my seminars at Bash you you've seen me talk about the line and when when it comes to zebra mussels which are the most uh, ferocious you know structure out there uh, it will cut twenty pound tests like it's nothing uh, twenty five will will survive a little better it'll still zip right through and thirty it, it's like an exponential uh, growth like the toughness factors that's where you need to be. 30 pounds will get get those fish caught and get them through the habitat so uh hey, hey, Pete, it was a treat i'm glad to be able to be you know help thrilled to to work with you on that justin and and i and i want to give you a shout out back too because a lot of times i bounce stuff off of you and you remind me of things and you you're you're a very good coach to be honest with you uh you know you've got a good mind for fishing and i'm not surprised you find yourself in the all-american this time on the boater side so it's pretty pretty awesome and uh and i want to get to our other boy um yeah mike reed and i want i want to talk to you mike because it was a you you were in foreign habitat uh by the way thank you for your service you're you're in the air force you're a military man and i want to thank you very much for that liked you from the day i met you you've been great uh partner with bash university being with us at the classic and uh, thrilled to death that here you are in a new new part of the country uh you're used to that kind of travel but man you just went out there and you took it to the boys in texas and uh now you're going to the all-american so uh congratulations and take take us through that buddy well thanks pete and uh i tell you you know this this year I, you know last year when i first moved to texas i, I kind of jumped in a little team deal um with a buddy of mine that i'd met and i just kind of spent the year kind of learning some of these lakes you know visiting them and um and just fishing local derbies you know and, and stuff like that well this year i'm like you know what this is just I, I was like i think i can compete you know i mean i get it dude i've never been to sam raver and i've never been to toledo bend and i get it you know everybody up here in North Texas, like, man, you're just going to get stomped going down there. You're just going to get stomped going down there. And I heard that, and I listened to it the first year, you know. And I was like, you know what? I'm going anyways. I need to learn it. And, uh, I mean, I feel like I can compete, you know. And, uh, and, you know, and it panned out, really, the first part of the year. Um, I either cashed checks or won the nine out of the first 11 tournaments I fished. And uh, so I had a lot of momentum. But, you know, mm. rolling rolling into this regional, man, I really bombed the two-day. I mean, it was horrible. I had a great practice. Once again, I hate practice. Did I tell you guys that? Um, <laughs> I mean, a phenomenal practice on Rayburn. Like, I mean, I like if I could have caught those fish, I mean, I could have won the tournament type practice. Um, but it just, it just didn't pan out. I fished another uh, two-day with the uh, – uh, you know, it's the old Bassmaster Weekend Series. I think they call it the Ram Truck Series now, run by ABA. It's a, it's a cool little trail. Um, you know, I was on the winning fish to deal that, do win that one, and and I just once again had a phenomenal practice, dialed in, and of course I just bombed it. Um, you know, didn't cut a check in that one. So I mean, I was just kind of on a losing streak there. You know, I had like four tournaments in a row, just wasn't great. Late summer. You know, offshore is just not my strongest game. Um, but, you know, I'm figuring it out a little bit. But I knew that going into this tournament, you know. Um, I just kind of knew that, you know, I was kind of in a slump. And uh, I spent my practice on day one. I know what I like to do. And I ran as far up that Ouachita River as you can get a boat. And, I mean, <laughs> I ran until you couldn't even troll with the trolling motor anymore. And there's water running in. And I started right there, and I fished my way down the river. And uh, right. I spent I spent probably five hours doing that. And I just I'm like, there's not enough up here. This is not going to be the deal. And that was mm. key to me because I, that's what I love to do. I mean, that's what I want to do. And uh, I just knew I had to get that out of my head, you know. And uh, and, and then I spent the next two days idling and running around looking. Um, you know, there was two major creeks I stayed in. Um, and I, that I knew had a lot of potential, but I knew every brush pile in those creeks. I mean, I knew every single one of them. 
There was, I mean, I literally, I don't think there's a brush pile in the back of Crystal Springs that I don't know about. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, I literally did. I put the trolling motor down the first morning. I was like, well, I'm going for largemouth first. I ran all the way to the back and there wasn't a single boat back there. And I just fished, you know, I, and, and, and funny enough, I just picked up a shaky head. I knew the tournament was going to be tough. You know, I, I grew up on a lake like this. I grew up on Lewis Smith Lake, which is a real tough fall fishery. You know, they have a real steep winter drawdown. Um, and I, and I, and it's a mixed spot largemouth lake, which I've had some of my best tournaments on. And I just, I just knew that these fish wanted to be on isolated cover, um, on flat banks. I just know large, that's what the largemouth want to do on these lakes. I, you know, and I know you can catch them other ways, but that's just, if I was going to do good in this tournament, I knew that's how I was going to catch them. Mike, I can't let you skip over the, the shaky head part. I need a little bit more detail on that what was your what was your rod set up were you throwing it on a bait caster were you throwing it on a spinning rod what what were you doing there what well, can i can i get in let me finish kind of talking about practice okay. and then can i jump in on that i'm sorry i kind of jumped ahead a little bit there but you know i i really i just i ran and ran and i saw the potential i ran in one creek and there was I mean, it was the most beautiful flat you've ever seen with isolated stumps and laid, you know, and, and brush piles washed up on this flat. And there's 20 boats in there on day two of practice, right? Well, I go back in there on day three, there's another 20 boats in there in practice. And I'm like, mm. I was like, but this is right, man. I was like, I know it's right. And, uh, I, but I didn't want to fish it. I knew it would ruin my confidence. Like, you know, just like Matt was talking about, I knew it would ruin my confidence. The, the lake was fishing so tough. I'm talking, you know, five to seven bites a day. You're not just going to blow through an area in practice. And as much as we we like to think that we fish professional all the time, we really don't fish great in practice. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard to get up. You, you can get up for game day, but, you know, sometimes in practice you go through the motions a little bit, and I didn't want to do that, you know? Um. So, and I, I just felt like that was the number one key for me was not getting washed out. Cause I talked to so many guys they were beat before the tournament even started, you know, um, a couple of buddies from Texas. Yeah. They're like, they're like, man, I flipped all that stuff and I couldn't get a bite on it. You know? And I was like, well, yeah. I didn't fish it. Yeah. That's interesting that you say that Mike, it's like not fishing sometimes adds to your confidence more than fishing does you know mm. it, it it's odd how that happens be and it and it destroys you during the tournament because if you fish through an area and don't get a bite you're never going there during the tournament never you've already eliminated it you know right right that's that that's the mental side it's so it's such a complicated thing but uh you in other words you can over practice you can yes. definitely over practice Yes. And then I knew, I knew I could, I could only fish so much, you know, you can only fish so much in a tournament. So I isolated myself to the two best looking creeks. And uh, then I had an offshore game where I found a bunch of brush piles out around the islands and stuff um, just for a fallback. You know, I can go catch some rat spots. I'm not going to win out there. Could I catch a keeper? Heck yeah, I can. I ain't going to win out there. I knew that, you know, unless something just crazy special happens. So I ran in the back of that creek and, and, you know, and I'm throwing a shaky head and I'm throwing the, uh, uh, well, I don't even know what shaky head it is. That's horrible. Isn't it? <laughs> it's the, uh, <laughs> I really don't, I have no idea what shaky head it is, but it's a shaky head and I'm just throwing a green pumpkin, green trick worm, man. I mean, it's like the simplest thing in the world on 10 pound line. And uh, it, was it a screw big... lock shaky head? Was it to that it, bar? Yeah, it was. It was a screw lock shaky head. Um, it's the Scott Canterbury shaky head. That's the one it is. There oh, you go. He yeah. makes it. He makes a phenomenal shaky head. It comes through brush and rocks better than any shaky head I found. Mm. Um, so that's why I like throwing it. I can throw it on the rip wrap like a, you know, even a quarter ounce, and I don't get hung up like everybody else and like all the other ones I used to throw and I'd be hung every two casts and then I'd throw my rod on the bank and run 50 <laughs> miles away. But, um, but anyways, right. yeah, I just started winging. I started on a brush pile on a flat and, uh, you know, it's about six foot of water. 
and about my fourth cast, you know, I caught one about two pounds, and I'm like, hey, oh, oh, hang on now, you know, <laughs> hey, I can get with this. So yeah. we mill, I milled around for a while, and it's funny, there is, there's the most popular boat ramp on this lake uh, for the guys, at least on the south end. And I mean, hundreds of boats put in here every day, and they all just blow through this creek, so the water's a little more stained back there. I like that. Um, there was the old isolated dock out there, the right by the boat ramp, but I don't know why, but it's not connected to the banks and nobody uses it, but also nobody ever fishes it. So, so I just trolled over there and, uh, I, I was fishing an old monster worm and, and I skipped that thing up underneath that dock and busted a three pounder. And, and that really got my day rolling, you know, and, uh, and and I ended up filling my limit with spots and then running to a marina and catching a couple of large mouth to coal out all them spots. But, um, that, that really, that really kept me in the hunt, you know, and I would, I'm telling you the back of that Creek was not the deal. That Creek was not the deal. Um, but it kept me in the game, you know? Yeah. And then on day two, I went, I started in the Marina where I called twice, which is basically an idol from <laughs> like, when they called my number, I never even put it on pad. You know, I just kind of dropped the trolling motor and, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and started right there. So I went to the back of that. I fished there for a while, didn't get anything going, and, and uh, went back to Crystal Springs again. And it just it just wasn't happening back there. So I made a move, and uh, I told myself, I'm like, hey, at 1230, Mike, you need to – it's time to put some fish in the boat, bud. You know, this is not going to work. I think I had two rat spots. and. So, you know, I went to my confidence. I knew I was in the right habitat. I, so I went to my confidence. And I started swimming a jig. And um, everybody swimming throws white. Do what? I said swimming a jig on Wachita. Is that a thing? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it will be now. I yeah, can remember right? Mike being uh, on the phone with you after day one. And you're like, hey, dude, I'm tying on a jig for you, Kimmel. Just a I swim did. jig. <laughs> yeah I, I was like tying on the justin kimmel swim jig yep um but uh yeah I, I make i make my own jigs you know i pour some jigs and uh and what i noticed the brim were up and they were up shallow and i'm talking about shallow pete i'm talking about like you know it's a foot deep 20 foot off the bank and they're on the bank i mean i'm talking about in you know, anywhere from three to six inches of water mm. and everybody and everybody up there is throwing a whopper plopper or a, a big old spook or a buzz bait or, you know, or something. And it's too clear to get a bite on a frog. I mean, the water's crystal clear. So I'm like, well, what can I, so I'm going to swim a jig, you know? So I put a green yeah. pumpkin jig on. And, um, and, and it's something I got confidence in when I, when I can swim it and flip it and get bit. And I know that, oh uh, yeah, I can it's catch it. Oh, I can catch it. So I ain't yep. got to put it down. Right. <laughs> so I did, I started burning that thing, just keeping it. I mean, the only reason I'm burning is because if I don't, it's in the dirt, you know? Yep. Mm. So I'm burning that thing as fast as I can. And, uh, and, you know, and I fished it for probably 45 minutes, and I'm like, oh, it's not really happening. And I got to this little back of a pocket, and I had a big roll. I mean, a big roll up. And I'm like, hmm, okay. That, that tells me something. I'm kind of do, I'm doing something right to get a reaction. Well, I move over to the flat and start flipping it, and I catch a couple of two-pounders. And um, at that point, it's like 130, and I've got four, two rats and, you know, two two-pounders. Well, I run in the back of this marina, and uh, I, I go to the shallowest dock they got. I mean, it's there's probably eight inches of water under this dock, and it's a <laughs> big, long. I mean, there's probably a hundred boats in this one dock, and I get up behind it, and I'm I'm flipping the in the boat slips, you know, I'm flipping, flipping, flipping. While I hear a blow up, and I'm like, oh man, I I get to that boat slip, and I flip that thing up there, and here I now I'm now I'm swimming, you know. And I called three times after that. I I caught my limit and called three times in the next thirty minutes. Oh my god! <laughs> so, and that ended up being my big bag. It was only ten pounds, but uh, you know I wasn't catching twenty six pounds or nothing. But but it was 
<laughs> but it was on October though. It's okay. Right. Yeah. But, just... but, but that's what happens. But and, and you know, and I never caught a single fish off the same thing twice. It, you could you could fish anything. And they weren't there. Yeah. There there was a couple things. I was doing something different. I really feel was key. And then I was putting my bait in places that other people weren't putting them. Mm. And I mean, in those tough tournaments, that's what you got to do. I mean, I really feel mm -hmm. like, you know, like, the, this yeah, I threw a shaky head, but I mean, I really only threw it for three casts, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that I just is, feel this sounds, this sounds, this sounds exactly like the Gerald Swindle junk fishing seminar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, but I mean, but I just, knew I was in the right area. You just fish, you know, you just, you're yeah. like, okay, well, how can conditions go? Um, day three was the same thing. It was bright and sunny for, you know, seven days in a row. Well, the clouds blowed in at nine o'clock and I'm like, uh, bud, hate to tell you, your dock meal is not going to work today. You know, yeah. mm. as much as I wanted it to work, it wasn't gonna. And I knew that. But, it, you know, it, once again, in fishing, it's the hardest thing to do is to leave it. And luckily I did, and I, and I busted a couple of good ones and got what I needed to have, you know. How did you bust a couple of good ones? I went back to that flat flipping. Flipping? You went flipping? Yeah. It and it's the, the same flat. flat. No boats. No boats. I mean, it had, every time I went back there, there was, you know, 20, 30 boats. You couldn't hardly even idle looking for brush. There were so many boats out there, you know. <laughs> and, uh. And yeah, and tournament day, everybody didn't give up on it, you know. Wow. Hey, but man, that's, that's where the fish are headed. They're headed yeah. there. It's fall. Yeah. Well, See? it's a great. Like I said, it's a it's a junk fishing seminar, and it's a great one. I mean, just keeping an open mind, and uh, it's very very tough practice. Going fishing to your strengths, looking for the bite th that is your strength, is is a huge thing, man. And. Uh, and yeah. and you did it, man. It's great. It's a great week. And what fourth place? Yes, sir. Yeah, fourth place in a in a monster field. A bunch of hey. local studs out there, you know. Yeah. Jake, can I, I interject I, something? I, yeah, I know Mike I commented. On, I know he commented on some of the keys that uh, that Matt made that stuck out to him. I'm gonna go ahead and tell you why Mike's an all American. He said he was putting his bait in places that other people can't. Well, let me tell you something about Mike Reed. If uh, if you hear that and you think you're just going to go do that without years of practice, <laughs> Mike Reed can put a bait in a coffee can 26 feet by, uh, you know, under a dock, you know, and do it 25 straight times. Um, he's one of the absolute best casters that I know of, and I think there's something to that with, uh, that had to be, you know, part of, uh, your win here, man, is, is the fact that you actually can do that. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me to know that old Alabama Mike Reed guy spent time in Georgia where you have to be able to good caster went out there at Wachita where maybe those region of guys don't have to do that all the time. You, you don't, you I'm telling you. Edge, my friend. And Dude, my, I, doc flipping, my, doc, my doc flipping game. So, you know this. We all grew up in and – I, and I, I'm from Alabama, but we my fishing game grew up in Georgia, you know. You know, I, I became a bass fisherman in Georgia. I mean, I, always, I fished tournaments out of the back and did all that stuff, you know, and had a great time. But I moved to the front in Georgia. So, I really feel like I cut my tournament teeth in Georgia, man. And, and dude, you're right. I mean, you remember, Justin. I mean, we both learned from one of the masters, oh, uh, Mr. Randy Woodham. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, oh, man, I dude, ever learned from Randy. I mean, like, the first time I fished with Randy, I'm like, um, yeah, I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, um, yeah, I want to grow up and be like that guy, you know? So, I mean, I did. I put a cinder block in the backyard and stood on a bucket, you know, and, and started trying to put a 10-inch worm through the hole of a cinder block that's 20 foot away, yeah. you know? And, ha and luckily, just so you guys know, a five-gallon bucket is almost the exact height of the front deck of a boat, or at least for a trite, and I know it is because I measure it. 
but um, <laughs> you would measure. Yeah, but but I mean, all that all that practice pays off. You know, I just remember the you know the <laughs> some of the neighbors driving around going, "Catch anything yet?" You know, like kind of laughing at me. I'm like, "Yeah, a couple of suckers," you know, and um, but <laughs> but yeah. It's, but all that stuff, you're right, it pays off. And, and, dude, I'm telling you, in Texas, you don't have to fish docks. I mean, I, they just don't get on them like that, you know? No. And uh, my, my, my dock flipping game kind of suffers being out in Texas, you know, because <laughs> you're just – you're you're bombing and winging most of the time. So, mm -hmm. Well, that's, but, that's interesting. Well, casting's key. I, you know, I've learned over the years it takes about 5,000 casts of any one particular cast uh, mm -hmm. to be, become proficient at it. Uh, you know, so, Hey, you know, we've got a bunch of guys that work full time and they don't get to fish as much as, as the guys that fish every day do. And so to become proficient at those casts, it, it takes a lot of practice and it, you can't, you know, most guys practice when they get on the water, you know, that's yep. the only time they cast, you know, is when they get on the water. And, uh, if you want to be able to skip docks like Alabama, Mike Reed, you need to, you need to get some practice in. But yeah, and it's risk. real expensive too. You know, like to learn this, it's real expensive. You got to get a cinder block and a five-gallon <laughs> bucket. <laughs> I I like it. I like it. I'm gonna send it over to Riz for uh, for an IM question. Yeah. So, Riz, Mike, when you're on a bite where you can both get bit flipping and uh, swimming a jig, what is the head shape on that? And and does it matter? Um, you know, if you're if you're if you're getting bit flipping and you're also swimming it back coming through cover, do you need a specific head shape and do you have one that works best for you? Um, so I don't know if you got you guys are probably familiar with the do it molds. Um, uh, there's one in there called the brush jig. Um, I really like that head for swimming mm -hmm. and flipping. Um, it's got a recessed eye. Almost everything I throw has a recessed eye. I hate the eye hanging out there. Um, everything I look for, whether it be a football jig or anything, I want that eye of that hook in the lead, you know, and that's just what I want. Um, but there's two, there's two jigs that I swim and that's that brush jig. And then I swim a little ball head jig. That's a really light. And it's just kind of one of those spot lake sneaky swim jigs. It's actually a finesse jig and you can, you can reel it. And you don't even have to shake your rod and you can reel it and it'll dart, you know, side to side a little bit on you. And, uh, but those are the two that I, man, I'm telling you on those mixed lakes, I've had a lot of success in the, in the fall, uh, swimming and, and flipping both of those. And what about the, uh, the weight on the jig that you were throwing? Um, so I was throwing a three eighths ounce, okay. uh, a weight on those. And, and even though it was so shallow, I, like I tried the quarter out, but I couldn't keep it in the water, you know, and, and I wanted the bait. I wanted to, it's super shallow, but I still wanted to bait down in the water. I didn't want to skim it across the top of the water because it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So three eight seemed to be the, the right weight. And, um, uh, on the baby jig that I throw, uh, three sixteenths is my favorite. And, um, on the trailer on your jig. So one of the things that, you know, some of our instructors have, have talked about a lot is how much your skirt lays over where the action of your trailer begins. How much of mm -hmm. your trailer do you have hanging off like the back of the hook? Like, so that, you know, you have all the legs kicking or do you have your, your skirt kind of covering a third of the trailer? What do you got going on? So, so I'm, I'm a zoom super chunk guy. I love a super chunk. I like a, uh, I like the pro chunk as well. Um, the pro chunks more of just a straight tail, um, it's, it's real subtle and you know in these clear lakes i mean i feel like subtle is just the way to go you know i don't i, I mean i don't need to throw the super duper you know super speed bull whip tail crawl daddy you know i just need i just need something with some action to it you know the little flutter action um and then speed i mean speed right. is, is speed kills and almost everything we do whether you're throwing a crankbait yeah. or a jig or if you can get this fish to react versus just wanting to eat, you can win you some money. Right. Braid or, you braid or fluoro? Because, no. Mike, I remember when we were together on your lake in Texas, it was fluoro on how we were swimming a jig that day. Were you were you, yeah. were you fluoro in, in this event as well? 
Yep, I, I threw 20 pounds fluorocarbon. Yep. Okay. Okay. That's only because there was no barnacles around. <laughs> That's or, or right. Florida back. They, but when you when you were when you were swimming that jig, you talking about speed. Were you doing the the high in the water column thing where you're where you're right under the surface, like six to well, twelve I, inches? Yeah. So it is high in the water column, but it was only like eight inches deep. So I mean, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Hey Pete. So so one of the things that I noticed. So we stayed. We stayed at a place that I could oversee uh, a big flat in the back of a creek, right? Mm -hmm. And you could look down, you know, it's kind of, you know, I mean, I was up there probably 100 feet, but um, you could see on the flat, you could see fish, you know? And I'm like, what? I couldn't tell if they were bass or what they were, but they're just sitting there. They're sitting on the bottom. Wow. They're like bellies on the bottom. Well, the more I got up there and in in the dirt and really like like there were several times I was idling at a pretty good rate of speed and I just turned my motor off and walked up on the front deck, trimmed my motor all the way up and just watched. You know? And they're bass up there. They're just sitting there. They're like sulking, you know, and I don't know I don't know why they're sulking, but they're waiting. Think they're just, waiting on the fall shad to come into their flat. I, th okay. I think so. I don't know what they're doing. But they're just. They're just. They're just waiting there. You know. Wow. And, and they're. It's they're almost like they're asleep. And I thought you had to wake them up. You know. I mean, literally, I felt like I was almost hitting some of these fish that ate the jig. You yeah. know. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Get, causing that reaction. That's. Wow. I mean, when you can do that, that's such a trigger. Like you guys did with the top water, man. You, that's a tool that takes a fish out of its comfort zone and makes them go nuts. And uh, and burning a, a swim jig is, is the same thing. Speed definitely does that too. But uh, wait, man, what a great deal, man. Three three guys, three all Americans. Uh, and and thanks so much, guys. I appreciate it. It was a blast ta talking to you guys. And and hang in if you guys want to. Uh, we've got Daniel Fennell coming with us, the man yep. in charge, the director of the BFLs for Major League Fishing. We're going to take a quick break, and uh, we're going to bring uh, bring the director in. So you guys can air your beefs if you want, um, or uh, offer some suggestions, or you know, ask some questions about the All American. You know that you guys are all going to be participating in. I'm looking forward to uh, to talking to Daniel, and it was great for the Bass University to participate with them uh to sponsor the the our regional here in the northeast and uh it, it was it was a great event they did a great job for us and uh and we look forward to speaking to them so uh riz i don't see btc so i'm assuming you're in charge and uh pulling the strings over there so let, let's take a quick break and we'll be back with more bash university live moment on the water not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together. The One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Tackle Warehouse is proud to sponsor the FLW Pro Circuit and is the official tackle retailer of FLW. Providing proven bass fishing gear as well as the newest and hottest tackle. Our friendly and knowledgeable customer service staff can help you every step of the way. And we offer free ground shipping on orders over $50. Tackle Warehouse. Everything for the bass angler at the lowest prices. Guaranteed. I have to be constantly on the lookout for new techniques to stay on the top of my game. Giant. Some have been more Giant. successful oh God, than others. Giant. The finesse fingernail. It happens every time. 
the chain gang. Ah, broke it off. The crow's nest. Never let go. And don't even get me started on tackle management, especially trying to stop rust and corrosion. Peanut butter. Hmm, that's good. Motor oil. Gotta keep the rust off all these baits. WD-40. Gotta keep the rust off. Silica, toothpicks, Q-tips, the list goes on and on. I'm hard on tackle, I fish fast, I need my tackle organized and protected. I can't be worrying about losing baits to rust. And when it comes to tackle management, there's only one solution. Flambeau Tackle Storage Systems with Z-Rust technology. The original anti-rust tackle box. Uncompromised clarity. Renowned durability. The infused anti-rust option that is FDA safe and free of harmful chemicals. The organization options are endless, but there's only one. One box, one anti-corrosion technology, one family-owned American-made brand, Flambo Z-Rust Tackle Solutions. Preserve, perform, repeat. And we're back with the Bash University live, the JK and Daniel Fennel takeover for segment two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, he's back. He's back. I'll let Pete take it. <laughs> we had, my break was a little longer than anticipated, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's, it's good to be back. Welcome, everybody, back to Bash U Live. What a great deal. We're celebrating the BFLs, uh, you know, the weekend Warriors tournament trail it's uh participated in all over the country and it's been great we've got three all americans on and now we have the man the man in charge the director of the bfls at major league fishing mr daniel Fen fennel thanks for joining us tonight not a problem thank you so much pete <laughs> it's been a great year i love fishing the bfls what a, what a great tournament trail you guys put together yeah, the deal is, man, is it's been so awesome this season alone. But, I mean, what a great lineage that the BFL's got anyway. I mean, going back through Redman and everything, you know. I mean, these uh, these events are such a pleasure to be a part of, and and we've had an amazing season. So, Well, you know, it, it, I had an amazing season, and, and one of my favorite parts of this season was seeing uh, my first – I guess it was Operation Bass, Red Man. I don't remember, yeah, but it was it was it was back in the 1700s, and um, <laughs> yeah, we uh, I, I saw some guys that I fished against that way that event. They 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 love it. They're still they're they're they love the competition. They love the tournament trail that you put together. They've been doing these tournaments for uh, 30, 40 years. I talked to one of the guys at the regional that has been to 29 regionals wow another one that was at 20 regionals uh it's it's an amazing uh you know tournament trail that's based in participation guys love it uh it, so it's been a thrill it's been a thrill for me man you guys really doing a great job out there well you did you had an amazing season pete uh <laughs> i didn't ever get to come out and weigh in at any of those but but we like to keep up every Every Monday, all of our tournament directors come back. We all operate in one central office. And so uh, so the word on the street was that Pete was catching them this season, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, it was a great season. Uh, but I got a beef, honestly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to the All-American because apparently I didn't have enough weight. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I wonder if there's anything you can do about that at this stage of the game. We probably won't pull any strings for you on this one, Pete, man. <laughs> that is the hardest part about those regionals is you – I mean, we've taken 24 divisions of the BFL. We've boiled it down to the guys who were consistent from the beginning of the year to the end. And then you have to go out there and beat the best from every one of those divisions. And, and not that you don't have the ability to do that, but you know it. I mean, some weeks it's your week, some weeks it's not, you know. And, yeah. 
And, uh, but they are amazing events, but there is no doubt that that all American, it's one of the hardest championships to qualify for period across the board. I don't care which one you're talking about by the time you get all yeah. those angles and you call out, you know, the guys that didn't make it, you're definitely dealing with, with top class competition at those. Yeah, there's, that's a fact, you know, right. These are the guys that, uh, they're full-time employees, right. They're working 40, 60 hours a week. They're, they're out competing, but they're competing on the bodies of work that are close to them that they're very, very good at. And yes, it, it, it's hard. It's, it's very hard to be competitive. So I want to congratulate the, the six guys that I competed against and made it to the all American. They did, they did an amazing job. And uh, down on the Potomac river, it was, it, it was, it was spectacular to see some of, some of the weights that some of those guys brought in. And, um, but, but yeah, it's, it, it is, it's a gauntlet. It's a gauntlet you got to get through. You got to, number one, you got to get there. So you got to, you got to beat all those guys. Then you got to get to the regional and you got to beat them all. And they, some of them have been to 20 regionals in that region <laughs> and, uh, you know, to get there. So yeah, it, it's quite, but it's quite an accomplishment, but we were looking at some, uh, I was looking at some stats, some names and, uh, and some of these guys are pretty impressive. Like, uh, I'm going to give away one of the questions because I think this is this is a cool stat to talk to you about. Uh, it's six All American champions that have later gone on to become super famous. Um, Shaw Grigsby, 1984. Rick Klein, 1985. Joe uh, Thomas, 1990. Clark Wendlet, uh, 1992. Stephen Brownie, 1996. Jacob Wheeler, 2011. Mm -hmm. um so some some pretty powerful guys have really got their start with with you guys at the all-american most definitely and uh you know just going back to the most recent superstar jacob wheeler you know i mean yeah. i was he did what he did in his high school events and really stepped his game up there but i i remember being his tournament director in the Buckeye division or Hoosier division for some of his first events, you know, and I mean, that guy to see how quickly he transcended the game, you know, to go from that, but to see, you know, the all American, it can be a launching pad. If you want it to be, it doesn't have to be, it, it's a life changer. No matter what you, you claim that all American title. It doesn't matter what your goals are. If you want to be a pro fisherman, it's a great thing to have on your resume if you want to re remain a weekend warrior, like you said out there, it's still, I mean, those are life changing things for these guys. You're talking about people that come through, you know, $1,100 worth of entry fees in a season, you know, and then to be able to turn that into a hundred grand or like Kimmel right there, paid basically 500 bucks for the season. He's got 50 hanging right there beside him, you know, and I mean, <laughs> it's so, it, I'll tell you the truth right now. It is my favorite tournament that we run. I've been fortunate enough. I've ran that event since 2010. And to be able to continue on that lineage of that event is, is a huge thing mm. in my book, man. Yeah. Well, you know, Justin, you know, obviously he won the all American uh, and has that check back there to, to show it, but <laughs> hey, a lot of the, that check. <laughs> <laughs> the, the other two are new to the all American. What, what advice would you have for guys? I mean, it's got to be a lot of pressure, right? They're going to be doing some things that, and participating in an event that's bigger than probably anything they've ever done before. What advice do you have for those guys that are new to it? It's, uh, it's such a transition from a single-day event to learning how to manage your fish in a multi-day tournament is what I really think is the number one key in those deals. You know, you're talking about mm. guys who qualified for these events – fishing mostly other than our super tournament one day tournaments you know so you can lean on them every day in those but once you get to this three-day tournament format fish management just like any multi-day tournament that we run turns into a huge thing pete sure well it, it, and it, it's a it's a big thing you're you're absolutely right because uh, you see those guys that can come out and destroy them in one day but man, to, to be able to be consistent and, and all the way through is, is a big deal. What about the pressures of that? You know, uh, the pomp and circumstance, the, you know, the, the, the bigness of the event that that's, that's gotta be, that's, I tell you, I've been to some big tournaments. That was the hardest thing for me to handle. 
Yeah, well, for sure. And again, you're taking a huge chunk of the people who qualify for that event have never been thrown or thrust into that scenario. I mean, typically our BFL events are a weigh-in trailer at the, you know, boat ramp location that we're at across the across the whole season. And then you get there, we've got camera boats, we've got camera guys and the boat with you. Just all those things that can somewhat take you out of your element. Some mental toughness yeah. is where it comes down to right there. I mean, but the good news is, is you can prepare for that. Okay. I mean, you don't have to go out and fish other multi-day events, but you have to go out there, even if it's a practice on your home body of water, doesn't matter. You can start trying to figure out, Hey, this is like a game plan. Here's strategy. Here's what I need to do to try to prepare for that as much as possible. Now, once I throw a bunch of camera guys on top of you, you know, I mean, you can't hold those nerves back if you've never been in that scenario before, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where you're at. You're fishing against that lake that day and against those fish that day. And so that's that's the constant, no matter if it's a single day event, the All-American, Pro Circuit, I don't care what it is. You're still fishing. You got to remember that, that you're still fishing against that body of water and those fish each day. So, Yeah, that can't, I, I agree. Between We talked about that earlier, how the what, what takes place between the ears often separates the guys. At, at the top level and uh jk let me that's interesting when you had the cameras in the boat mm -hmm. how did that make you feel you survived and and thrived but did were you were you did did that make you nervous did that make you uh do anything different it's different for a co-angler and i'll say that by um it's not your boat and you're kind of sharing space with the cameraman all of a sudden you know, he's back there with you. His bag's all over top of you. You know, he's got wow. a big giant camera bag. Mm -hmm. um, and you, your space is just a little bit tighter. Um, I do feel like the pressures of the camera, but thankfully I, was, I had one at the Toyota Series Championship too. So I, I've kind of, I've walked through that, you know. Um, they kind of give you reps too, because they even interviewed the co-anglers at the beginning. I know they probably never used that footage or anything, but it, it was kind of cool because you got to get the reps, you know, for maybe one day you're in that situation. Um, but I got to be honest, Pete, my first hour of the last, final day of the All-American in Todd Goat's uh, boat was horrific. <laughs> um, I, uh, I knew the decision that I needed to make off the cuff. Um, and I couldn't find my bag of worms. Couldn't find them. And I was kind of frazzled, you know, with the with just the extra camera guy in the boat. Todd Goad's smashing them early. You know, he's catching a very quick limit that day on a really tough tournament. And, uh, you know, it took me an hour to be like, okay, I know I have them somewhere. And I'm not catching them on my second guess. And I had put them in the wrong bag. You know, I had like three of those <laughs> missile bags, clear missile bags. And I finally just calmed down, took a drink of water, ate one of my lucky peanut butter balls and said, okay, dude, what, this is the thing you want. You're sure they're here. And I found them in another bag, picked them up and caught like a three pounder, like almost instantly. Right. And, uh, it took that to kind of calm down, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it got me. For the first hour having that camera in the boat, that was, uh, I couldn't think clearly. You know, I couldn't even be like, hey, check your other bags, doofus. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, 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 the pressure's got to, it, it's insurmountable at that moment, you know? And, yeah. uh, of course, I, I, I can appreciate it. I'm disorganized as a rule, so I can <laughs> never find what I'm looking for. But, <laughs> I, I apparently we all need to get lucky peanut butter balls Pete, it's uh, easy for to our stay, next competition. It's easy to stay organized when all you do is just you you just keep it simple. You throw a sink out. You can just <laughs> keep one pack in the boat, you're good to go. And well, that's not a knock I, on you at all. I mean I'm yeah. I'm the same guy. I, I don't know where anything yeah. is in my boat, but if I'm not catching them on one of three things, I'm probably not having a real good tournament. So yeah. And, uh, and and obviously, if you listened earlier in the show, I no longer have to worry about drop shot fishing at all. Yeah. Um, and take it right <laughs> out of the equation. <laughs> it's, it's, at, it's at the bottom of the lake. So so we got this big All-American. Man, we're, we're going to be rooting for all these guys. Um, 
what to, what's what's happening over at the BFO? What do you guys have in store for us in 2022? Man, we're excited. Again, we're coming off an amazing season. Um, in the 2021 season, we saw a 20% increase in participation. Okay. Wow. And so that's a big jump, man, even for us. Yeah. And, and, and it ebbs and tides, you know, just like anything else does. But, and again, not that we give credit to anywhere, but I'll tell you the truth, man, COVID brought a lot of people out of their house and got a lot of people on the water. And <clears throat> with all the coverage, it doesn't matter what you're watching, but there's enough uh, outdoor fishing coverage now that it's it, it can get you hooked for sure. And so we anticipate to have just another phenomenal season coming up this year. Uh, we've got what I think is a great schedule out there, all 128 tournaments that we're gonna have in the CFL for 2022. And uh, we've got six tournament directors out there that are gonna go out there and knock it out of the park for everybody every weekend. And so we're excited for sure to get this season going. It's always hard to get the season going when you haven't wrapped up the season that you're working on right now. And and we do. We've got one event left in the BFL. We've got the wild card coming up uh, over in East Tennessee, Fort Loud and Teleco Lakes. And after the, it's not this week, but next week, and we'll ha we'll stick a fork in 21 and and we're ready to hit 22 wide open, man. Man, well, it's it's uh it's exciting. I saw the trail for my region, which is, is, is a great tournament trail. And the guys, Steve did a great job with us sure. uh, up in my division, really enjoyed working with him. And, uh, and all the tournament directors are just so, you know, they're so phenomenal and they work so hard at what they do. And it's such a hard job. You know, you, it, it must be hard to find the right guy <clears throat> to do that job. You know, well, like Steve, this is his first year being a BFL mm -hmm. tournament director, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, with that being said, Steve has worked for us for a decade on our Toyota Series crew and mm -hmm. on our formerly FLW Tour crew and now uh, Pro Circuit crew. So Steve's been around, and, and, and we like to do that. We like to bring people through the system because then they've been there hands-on. You know, I mean, it, we've learned – all across the way, you'll never make 100% of people happy, okay? I mean, any decision, any schedule you put out there, whatever it is, some people are going to love it, some people won't love it, you know, right. depending on what the intangibles are. But uh, but we've got a great group of guys. Steve, like I say, he's our freshest BFL tournament director, and he went out there and smashed it this year for you guys. And so so that's just that's kind of the standard that we live by. And uh, and I couldn't be more proud than our entire our entire BFL team is amazing. So. Yeah, you should be, man. And I, I got to say something about it, too, you know, just looking at it. And, you know, I've had a, some good local success. I've won, been fortunate to win a lot of tournaments. But uh, the BFLs is the proving grounds. That's the proving grounds that has changed my life from tournament su success. You know, I don't know that I'm sitting here with my job knowing who Pete Glusek is and all that stuff with our – even having our relationship without my BFL regional win on uh, Hartwell and, you know, winning a couple of regionals and all American and, and participating in 50, 60 some odd tournaments over the last six or seven years, you know, that you get to know some of these tournament directors and they, they're such awesome people. They mean something to you, you know, like I got, I love it every time I see you guys, you know, and, and Leroy, you know, you, you always remember somebody who gives you a big old check or gives you a certificate <laughs> for a boat, yeah. obviously, but you know, Leroy Hensley and Alan Gray and Brad Callahan, you know, I get to see all the Mike Hale, our guy from Bulldog this year, you know, I've, I've, I've journeyed with those guys. I've come up with those guys and they've all been, they've all been consistent, man. That's the one thing you get out of the BFLs is that consistency you get a top-notch tournament director and you know it, it over the years it, it starts to get more and more fun it, it's it's honestly like coming home every time i fish a tournament with you yep. guys and they and the, you know what jk I, I gotta chime in on this too it they it's it's almost like they go slightly above and beyond to make sure that the anglers are not only well taken care of as far as far as the tournament aspect but also that they feel comfortable in in how the whole process works and yeah. i can speak to this on on last year before the before the bfl super last year on the chesapeake that i was fortunate enough to 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 have a good tournament and win my boat had been in the fiberglass shop 
for mm -hmm. almost two months leading up to that tournament. So to say that when I showed up at the ramp the day of that tournament, to say I was disheveled and I didn't know what was going on, the only thing I knew was that I paid my entry fees and I responded to the messages I needed to respond to. I didn't know where I was supposed to be, what time, who I was supposed to get paired up with. But you know what? I found somebody with with the with, with the logo on their shirt and it was like they just directed me in the directions that I that I needed to go. They, your your co-angler is going to be over here. You need to be here at this time. You you know, make sure you have your 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 kill switch ready to go. Live well, all that stuff. It was so, you know, welcoming to walk into that environment when I picked my boat up at two o'clock in the morning, the, like the night before. Yeah, so I, I had that. no idea. I showed up, you know, just like getting to the getting to the boat ramp was the only thing I was thinking about. And the whole crew of the the BFL staff, it was just, you know, they were they were they were appreciative. They were glad every angler was there, and it just, you know, it felt like. It felt like I was a part of something walking into my first tournament ever, you know, not knowing anyone. So that's shout out to you guys for that. Man, yeah. thank you so much. I've got two points for what you guys just said right there. Uh, point one is that if you can't enjoy doing what you're doing with our job, then you're not going to have fun in life, period. OK, I mean, we are so fortunate to be in the position that we are. I mean, every person that I know outside of fishing. Right. When I try to explain to them what I do for a living and how this all works and what's going on there. I mean, it's a mind blowing experience to be able to try to tell somebody that this is what you do. <laughs> and so we are so blessed and fortunate on the first end of this that we get to watch sunrises. We get to see things that, you know, a lot of people sleep through some of my favorite moments in life. OK. And so we're extremely blessed to have the positions that we do. And, and so that makes it easy to be able to help you guys any way that we can. Now, also with that being said, point two is that when you do run 128 events a year, you know, you do that for a couple of years, you can turn that into a well-oiled machine. Okay. I mean, you don't have to get years and years of experience the way that we throw guys out there on the road to go and run these events i mean you can get trained up on the right way and the wrong way to do things real quick and i promise you if you do things the wrong way it only takes one or two times before you got it all squared away and so again i appreciate everything that you say for our staff I, i'll throw out one more thing so we've got six tournament directors in the bfl and then we've got 10 teams out there that pull our trailers logistically all across this country for those events and then we've got 10 or 11 other teams that go in there and fill in those positions like check-in and everything and i'll just say uh since i've got the platform that i appreciate each and every one of you more than you know and thank you for all the great jobs that you do out there because you can hear it from these guys right here that we're doing it right whenever people come across with that kind of you know when they walk away with that kind of experience then great job guys yeah, Daniel, we actually got a couple questions uh, on the message board uh, for sure. you. And there, there's there's some people, uh, boaters and co-anglers, um, that would like to know if somebody wants to get involved in the BFLs and they want to they want to be an angler or a co-angler. What's the what's the steps they should take and, and how do they uh, get their foot in the door here? Here's the best advice I can give anybody. Read that rule book first. You can find it at MajorLeagueFishing.com and uh, go to the BFL circuit. And before you click on anything else, click on the rules and go over that because we have, you know, the majority of the issues that come up in a BFL are not because somebody is trying to do anything wrong. It's just not understanding the rule. And so step one, read those rules. Step two, if you're not comfortable just like bumping out there and, and going for it, just putting it down, come watch a weigh-in with us. Come hang out with us. Talk to anglers around there. Uh, gather what their experience is overall from those events. But then uh, the next step is if you have zero experience in tournament fishing, our co-angler program is one of the best tools ever for learning uh, not just what to do on the water, but just learning the whole tournament format, how all that takes place, what goes on, how important is boat check in the morning, how all these things, you know, you got to put all that together. 
but it all starts at majorleaguefishing.com and in my opinion starts right there in the rule book because that will help you out tremendously and it's also a guide it's it's a path to show you here's the steps here's the processes here's what you need to do but i'll tell you the truth too you can also call our office number and every one of our tournament directors i mean we we talk to anglers every day all day long and we're there for you to try to help you and lead you any way that you need so well and i want to just you know echo that and and say to the people that are new like all the new covid people and people that want to get involved you know with the sport i mean it it's fun it's easy uh, you don't have to have the boat. You can come and be a co-angler at the BFL. And I've, I've fished with, uh, with so many people that are brand new to it. And uh, they have a blast. They're some of the funnest people to fish with. And, and as, as a boater, we love the guys that are brand new. You might be intimidated. You might think you have to have all this experience and this know-how. But this is the place to get the know-how. Yes, sir. Um, you know, so, so don't. Don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid. Get get signed up. Come out. If you if you don't have a – you can travel. Here's the cool thing. As a co, especially, you can – like in my region, we, we go to the best bodies of water in the world, uh, Thousand Islands, uh, Cayuga, Chesapeake, Potomac River. You get an opportunity to jump in the boat and fish some of the greatest bodies of water in, in this part of the country and all parts of the country. Um, and, you know, at, at a minimal expense and get some amazing experience with some, some anglers that have been doing it for a while. So, so don't, don't, don't be afraid of that. Just jump in. If it's something you're interested in, or you think you might be interested in, give it a try. You know, we, we, we love to have you, you know, and I, and I fished with a, a lot of great co's this year. Uh, it was a great experience for me in the BFLs and, uh, you know, once again, I, I simply hold a grudge against the, the BFLs for just simply because I didn't have enough weight. I didn't get to go to the All-American. You know, it's, it's, it's a little upsetting, but <laughs> we're, we're still recovering from it. But, uh, but no, it's, it's, it's a great experience for somebody new. And, uh, and Daniel, thank you so much. Thanks you so much for hanging out with us and, and yeah. sharing the, this experience with us. And, and, uh, you know, anybody can can join up, go check it out. And uh, we hope to see, uh, well, I hope to see you somewhere out on the BFLs next year. Yes, sir. Well, uh, thanks again. And, um, and Daniel, we'll, uh, you know, we'll be in touch because we really enjoyed our partnership with the BFLs this year. And uh, hopefully us at the Bash University can, uh, can, partner with you guys and do something really cool for next year we we certainly hope for that i think we will seems like an amazing matchup guys so we'll be happy to have you anywhere you want to be with us awesome awesome well thank you sir and um and now you know i want to thank everybody for watching and uh really enjoyed it i want to congratulate all of the uh, all american qualifiers for being with us tonight and rich i know uh, i know we've got a few uh items we got to do we got we got to like and share we have a trivia question we got to we got to offer up tonight what do you want to do first yeah that's right uh we're not we're not quite wrapping up here yet guys so stick with us we got some awesome stuff that we're going to be giving away uh towards the end of the show here and uh, i just want to take a second to remind everybody that guys the bash university in the classroom is back we are headed down to anderson south carolina Ooh. and gadsden alabama this yes. winter to get back in the classroom with the whole Bash University family. And right now, you can get your tickets while they're still available on early bird pricing. That's 25% off on your tickets to come learn in the classroom directly one-on-one -on -one with some of the best anglers in the world. We're going to be in Gadsden, Alabama and Anderson, South Carolina in the month of January of 2022. So guys, we want to see you in the classroom Come learn with us. It's a great opportunity to take your fishing to the next level. No question. No question. And we, uh, we look forward to joining you guys out there and uh, being back live in studio. You know, JK, it's, um, it's going to be awesome to be back in the classroom. I'm so excited to get back, see our guys that we haven't seen in person in a couple of years, you know, that we're used to seeing a lot of our students year after year. Yeah. You know, I can't wait, man. It's just so much 
it's just a different feel. I love our virtual stuff and I look forward to doing some more of that, you know, but uh, something different about being inside that classroom, man. Oh, it's well, it's an experience is what it is. And, you know, not only are we all learning fishing, but we all share that. And, uh, you know, we get to share that with each other. And some of the some of the best friends and fishing partners ever have met each other at Bass University yeah. seminars no doubt. Know, over the years. So it, it, it's really cool to come back Do BTC. Do you have a which which trivia question are we going to ask? There's so many. You are so over prepared for this one. <laughs> well, hello there. Which one, which which one do we go with? Oh, we're going with one? We got we got a whole bunch here. I thought there was some really good uh I mean, I think there's just really good questions that we ought to we ought to get the content out there that that you know what I mean? I'm with you. You want you want to go uh, I I didn't know how you had this planned out. So planned? I'm asking you. All right, so you want me to go through I'll go to the first one. Yeah. Yeah, get some of this out there. All right. What was the name of the organization that started the All-American and eventually became the FLW? I heard Pete Glusick say it earlier tonight. I know the answer. That's, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I Kelsey? remember. I remember um, I remember we used to get, uh, what were those? Vienna sausages. <laughs> every, every, we get, we get, the, we get the, can, we'd register for the tournament's weight line and we would get like a hat and we would get a can of Vienna sausages when we registered for the tournaments <laughs> under this name, that was a big deal. Because be, <laughs> being from where I'm from, that was gross. Vienna sausages were like horrible. Yeah. But uh, Twinkies or you know, something, you know. Uh, other people loved them, you know. Yeah, it didn't it didn't take the message board long to get this one right? Not at all. <laughs> and that Who would won? be Operation Bass. Operation, Operation Bass. Bass. So so no. so, Bry. As we as we move to the to the further questions, they get harder. Yeah. Right? Did we give away the guild card tonight and all that stuff? Yeah. So so actually, the first question we're gonna we're we're gonna be giving away here is uh is is that one? And Coach Prince got that question right first Coach. with Operation Bass. But guys, as we move forward through here, uh, you know, harder. if you get these questions right, we're gonna send you a a, a Bass University shirt. And when we get to the last question. Uh, the the, the first of the the first of the last ones the hard questions <laughs> first of the last <laughs> the first of the last we're gonna do the, uh, the grand prize the giveaway that's right <laughs> Dude, I love this BTC this is awesome yes um who is the only all American champion to later be banned from competition Ooh. by the league how about that uh, I remember I, this name I don't remember is this the, one on uh, the easy fraction it yeah. is you yeah. what oh. Uh, I'll tell you the infraction. I know what what he was doing. What he had, he had a scuba diver sitting with bass in a cage. Come on. And he and the scuba diver would be waiting there. That he would flip his jig in the cage and put he you know the coin like it's crazy. The guys just literally caught all of his fish on one cast. The scuba diver would grab it, hook a bass. Give a special, you know, tug or something, Dude. and and the guy would catch the bass. Now, what about the bubbles gets, from yeah, the scuba tank? Bubbles. He was finally caught because some random homeowner saw a scuba diver climb out of the water, and it lo just looked way too suspicious, and uh, it got. Wow. Uh, it got one thing led to the next, and uh, he got caught. And wow. uh, it was a, it, it was a rebreather. They, I, I recall, like uh, they have a rebreather system that yeah. doesn't give up bubbles. And and it was weird because, like you said, J.K., I recall that the he kept making the repetitive cast to the same exact spot, mm -hmm. and uh, that was one of the one of the giveaways. Yep. Uh, and we don't have an answer for that yet. Man, not yet. Let me get the uh, YouTube and huh. Facebook. I uh, I remember, um, and I don't remember who tried to do this, but I remember we got uh, a winner. Well, <laughs> a correct answer. Sorry, Sean. We'll, we'll send you a T-shirt. It's uh, Tony Christian. Tony Christian. Yeah, that's Sorry. 
<laughs> Tony Christensen, but we'll give it to him anyways. Sorry to air yeah. you out. Yeah. So I guess Mike Long and Tony Christian are have, have a bass club. Yeah. Uh, yeah, days. Mike Long was actually one of the first answers submitted. <laughs> uh, uh, that was a terrible negative question, BTC. <laughs> but, uh, All right. And the, the, the next one is who are the only anglers to win more than one All American, one of which was mentioned earlier in the show? If you guys were paying attention. Wasn't Tony Christian, like, not like a motivational speaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's. He's doing now. That's the other Tony. Tony uh, Montana. Tony Montana. <laughs> when with one or more, one more All American. Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting because we were talking about this guy, and uh, they were saying that he would spend six months at each All American planting brush prior to the event. And, wow. Uh, it sounds it sounds to me, J.K. Like that's what you guys are planning on doing. Yeah, there's too much work to be done in between <laughs> to get out <laughs> and uh, and and plant brush. But uh, I can find everybody else is pretty good with my hummingbirds. How about <laughs> it? No doubt, no doubt they'll. Uh, but the, it, it's it's amazing how many guys were up to that. You know, uh, I look at some of these years because I see the years that they won in yeah. the eight in the eighties. 90s well and this guy won i mean he he won all americans he also made bassmaster classic through the old weekend series bid uh i think yep. he made an open maybe so he's fished multiple bassmaster classics as well and uh, he was the brush king you know i can remember i talked to john murray today um who might be in the classroom with us this year what and uh John's one of my favorite uh, seminar teachers of all time. But uh, John was telling me that he got third place in an All-American to this guy. And John was fishing brush. And he got third place. But uh, <coughs> he said he didn't plant brush, you know. So, but he did something different. He was throwing a drop shot in the brush. <coughs> Excuse me. In the brush. Well, I, I, I have never planted brush. But. I got to say, after Ida has scattered the brush on the, the, you know, some of the bodies of water that I fish, <laughs> Ida. and there's, there's a lot of brush that is on the bank, and uh, I, I, I'm going to get with Riz, and, and me and Riz are going to tie our bass cats to some of this stuff, and we're going to drag it out to about five you're feet. Gonna be sitting, you're going to be sitting behind the steering wheel. <laughs> I, see, I see what you just did, Pete. Everyone oh, sees it. I'm ready. Let's I'm gonna, go. Get, I'm gonna get with the youngest guy we got here. Mo Let's go. Best shape and make him jump in the water and tie stuff off. I'm in. Hey, I'll, I'll catch him off every one of those mfers. <laughs> Let's go, Pete. I'm ready. Dude, we'll use your, we'll use your <laughs> boat. I'll bring the rope. <laughs> there's some man-sized trees laying all over the bank. Let's go. You know? so, got this right yet? No, nah, no, nobody's got it I right. Got but the answers are Dean Starkey and Jeff Coble. We actually. Had somebody chime in on the YouTube side of things Jig with Jig Squad. one of the right answers. Yeah, Coble. Mr. Mr. Yeah. Jig Squad. Coble, so. I, I, I planted brush one time uh, a million years ago with Dave for a Cooper River tournament back when we were drawing like 60, 70, 80, 90 boats on Cooper River. It was worth yeah. it. We even had a bass boat there one year. Uh, but, um, yeah, I was I was in charge of getting the brush and getting the uh, the block, and Dave was in charge of rope, and he screwed it up. <laughs> he, well, he got freaking twine, rope? dude. He got twine. You know that stuff that's it's all hairy. Yeah, it's twine always doesn't hairy. work. Nah, yeah, he had twine, and and he had a GPS that he hadn't figured out how to use. So we just said screw it and start triangulating with less than three points. <laughs> <laughs> and then and, and then we had a, a, a storm, a flood storm, and it was all gone. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Spent half a day I, looking for brush that wasn't there. I, you know, I I would like to interview the guys that that do this a lot and how much of their efforts are, are in vain. <laughs> you know, like the brush piles float away, they break apart, fish never use I'll them. Send you a link to the Bass U Live episode we had with them guys, Pete. 
Dude, there's guys who will use a metal hook. Yeah. You think you're on the juice one day and you wake up in the tournament and your brush is gone? That's because somebody saw you on their brush pile and 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 dropped that hook down there later and dragged it off. Some guys need there's side jobs. Doing, there's there's guys doing that. Crap. They need they need they need other jobs. What do you got? Yeah. What's the next one, Rich? All right, we're going to uh this is a medium question, which is harder than the last one. I don't know. Yeah. I think this is uh well we'll see. Uh, who was the founder of Operation Bass, which later became the FLW? Who was the founder? And I, I know I know this man's name, but I would have never, ever been able to get this right. Of course, a Google searcher can probably get it, and they're, they're going crazy right now trying to do that. But it's a great question. And BTC? Yes, sir. I apologize, but I uh, gave away the next question. Uh, during right. the interview process that's okay that's all right we'll just skip over that one and go to the first uh the first hard one for the next one since we already gave that one up yeah yeah yes who Ooh, and, 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 wow that one came in quick wow matt, matt g matt g with mike whitaker mike whitaker wow. founder okay. of operation bass later wow. became wow. flw nice job matt g rest in peace <laughs> flw yeah. Now, was it ever called Redman? Do we know that? Like, yeah. was it was it Operation Bass, but it was sponsored by Redman, and we just called it that? Maybe, maybe that was the Redman's. When was that? Like the eighties, nineties? Yeah, back when, back before, t t tobacco companies were banned from everything <laughs> in the world. Right. Yeah. Can they can honestly can. used to give you? You'd get a bag of Redman, and you <laughs> you'd get one one of those cans. <laughs> Here you go, kid. Dip. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you don't need breakfast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just use this. Here's some pickled yep. meat stuff. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's awesome. Really? I mean, we get weenies and red man and skull. You know? Nice. <laughs> but um, <laughs> all right, Pete. The next, the next, the next one that we go with here from the uh, got to read it twice from the me. from the. The, the rock chalk challengers here uh, of the hard questions is going to be the grand prize. So what? pick which one you pick, which one you go with here. We going hard, and uh, we're 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 sending it out there. The hard one for these guys, right. grand prize. For the subscribers, okay. On the, on I'm going to go positive. I'm going to go positive. In, okay. uh, well, on this question, because uh, this is this is crazy. What um, we have the lightest winning weight, which we'll talk about, and uh, we have uh, NFL tie in and I'll, we'll talk Ooh. about that after i ask the question this question what is the heaviest winning weight in all american history mm. what is the wow. heaviest winning weight and, and that's um, for a three-day right it's always been a three-day event as far as i know we looking for the exact weight we might be we here are. a while yeah and He's... who won it and the lake that he won it on and the year that he won it <laughs> but uh the lightest the winning weight which i could have guessed jk give me give me right off the top of your head where did the what body of water did the lightest winning weight come from well it's either going to be the ohio river or the three rivers ding, area ding, ding 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 ohio river you're right right off the bat 12 yep. pounds five ounces rick lamontine la lamontine uh, West we'll Virginia. Take it reads uh, La Mountain. La, La Mountain. La Mountain. Rick the Mountain yep. must have been a giant man. Rick the Mountain. Man. Well, <laughs> this was a giant. This was a giant man. Apparently, what NFL pro uh, defensive lineman competed in the second All American? The second All American. Dang, that's a ways back. Yeah, wow. this is this is way back. Uh, he was he was a St. Louis Cardinal. From 1969 to 1979. That's any football team. The St. Louis Cardinals are the baseball team. Atlanta That's Falcons true. and St. Louis Cardinals, yeah. Oh, the Atlanta Falcons. And there St. Louis Cardinals. I missed that part. You got it. He fished in the, the, the 26th. He finished oh my 26th. Gosh, we already in the got 1984 All American and was a Ken regular in North Georgia bass Holy tournaments crap. for many years. Look at that. We got we got a winner for the for the actual grand prize question already. Wow. Uh, who? What? Yeah. Yeah. C Stew. Didn't waste Stew. any time. 
66 pounds, five ounces. Who's C. Stu? Oh, I don't know. Smoke. C. Stu, way to go, man. That was either either you have an impressive history of bass fishing knowledge, or you got really fast fingers and a strong computer to type. Yeah, he's got a good connection. Yeah, you got a really strong connection, probably. Let's do good job, I man. Stu. C. Stu, well okay. done. See that, guys? It pays to be a Bass U TV subscriber. Yeah, it does. I mean, come on. The discounts yeah. alone. Yeah. I had a buddy right. in the DM saying, oh, yeah, I get 35% off for Pilo. Like, what, well, dude? You got 40 to 50 if you're a Bass U subscriber. Keep mm. cowing. <laughs> no, <that's, laughs> it's been this way for years, bro. Missile baits. Yeah. Oh, hey, guys, the nation just gave me a discount. Like, come on, man. We got you all year long. <laughs> Knock it off. <laughs> you know what telling me? Knock it off. Oh, my goodness. Knock it off. <laughs> Hey, so so um, congratulations, guys, on on all your wins, and uh, we have a, a Facebook like and share, guys. Last chance, go like and share us, and uh, Riz is going to be picking a winner here real soon. And uh, BTC, I told a story earlier about Aaron Martins and um, his win here on the Upper Chesapeake Bay, yeah. and how that that you know um, played into uh, what the guys were saying about the St. John's and, and hmm. the bites during the core tide were missing it, missing uh. it. And he, and Aaron kept saying, I got to wait for the tide. I yeah. got to wait for the tide. And when the tide got right, he smashed them like nobody's business catching a seven pounder, um, you know, on a, on a vibrating jig, I think it was. And, uh, and it was amazing. I'll never forget that. And, um, and I'll never forget this. I fished a thousand islands this year and uh, the partner that I drew out with on one of the days of uh, competition was uh, a observer. What do they call them? Um, when they're Mar in, a marshal, he was a marshal with Aaron and we were telling Aaron Martin stories all day. We were thinking about him and uh, we were praying for him and we were, you know, just, just with him that day out on thousand islands and uh, telling stories about him but he, he said he told a cool story and aaron aaron congratulated him or appreciated him because he knew the difference when aaron was talking to himself versus when he was talking to the marshal <laughs> <laughs> he, he could he could tell the difference and aaron knew that he could tell the difference and uh, appreciated that and, that's awesome and yeah it was awesome <laughs> It was it was it was an awesome moment. It's making me a little emotional right now because yeah. I'm thinking about the times when I've been in the company of Aaron, and it's always been uh, it's just been great. It's always been great to know him and know know you, Aaron, and um, you know just just want to want to let you know that we're thinking about you, and uh, sure. all of us here at the Bash University are thinking about you right now. Um, but um, I just want to put I just wanted to say that about my good friend Aaron Martins. I know he's going through uh some tough times. I know everybody knows he's he's battling uh some a lot of medical issues and uh and we just want to let him and his family know that we love him. We think we're thinking about him and uh and he's he's one of the best. He's one of the best that ever did. It. Yep. 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 One of the nicest guys in it. fishing. Just a just a good dude, man. Just a kind pure soul. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Nothing like me. <laughs> <laughs> He's well, it's something to, something to aspire to, BTC. You know, true. It's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. He's he, he's a lot, but uh, yeah. But it's great. It it, it, it like I said, it's it's great. It was always great to be in his company. I always you always felt yeah. like uh, you were uh, so important. You know, like yeah. when you were with him, he, you know, it, it, he connected with people in a lot of different ways and. Um, yeah, I, I always loved him for that. And, uh, yeah, just Still thinking do. about, just thinking about him and wishing him, wishing him, man, all the best, yes, all indeed. the best, man. Yep. Yep. We were thinking well about said, him, buddy. Uh, so. shout out to, uh, uh, fan, fan of the week or, uh, uh, Bass U subscriber, Andre Alvernaz. Andre, this is for you. For our, all the questions I answer for you in my DMs. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Andre have been having fun the last couple of days. And uh, and shout out to Paul Benson, big fan. Paul's a buddy, and uh, love Paul. Always thinking of Paul. Team Paul. Team Paul. That's right. Shout out to Paul Benson. We're th we are thinking about you too, and uh, 
And I want to give a shout out to our, our boys at Five Alive who had their classic um, yep. this this past couple of days. And uh, the uh, Eco Bass Angler finished fourth place in that tournament. And um, Greg Duran. So you see, see Eddie Cowan had a big comeback. He was like tenth on day one, and what he finished second or third. He had a, he had the biggest bag, like a thirteen pound bag yeah. on day two. Saratoga's a, where you, where Saratoga's a stingy, pounds. stingy, stingy water man. I mean, it's not yeah. stingy. You catch you catch a uh, twenty five to twenty five to forty fish a day, but they're just all less than two pounders. You know, so for right. Eddie Cowan to put together you know a thirteen something, that's a uh, he was doing something there. About it. Yeah, Eddie's got a history of doing something. He's been a yep. super super stud in the in the fishing world. Uh, how and, how uh, our guy Dale Jr. Surprised. made that event, dude? Yeah, Dale Jr. I saw him way in. Congratulations, <laughs> Dale Jr. Congratulations for making it, man. He 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 busted in. He busted into the lineup in the wild card spot. That's you right. Know? What a, what a cool dude. Five Alive. I mean, what a what a great club. It's mm. uh. It's 150 plus members in a club, in a yeah. fishing club. Are they it's got 150? A, it's, yeah. Oh if, my God. if you're in a, the if, tremendous... if you're in the Jersey area, or I mean even beyond, you know, really, PA, Delaware, There's PA guys that belong. Yeah, and you're you know looking for a club to join. I mean, honestly, you know, Five Alive is one of the only clubs in this area that it is. Well, it's actually the only club in this area. That you can go fish a club tournament, put in a day of practice, and if you, you know, if if you do well in that tournament, you will make money. Uh, you know, as far as your fishing is concerned, you know, if you have to take a day off, spend gas money, all that, they get enough guys at every club tournament. The entry fees are set up right. The paybacks are set up right. That you can legitimately fish competitively in a club environment and walk away with some with some scratch on top of, of your, of your fishing day. So, you know, if you're, if you're in the area, look them up, join them up. That's a, it's a great way to, uh, yeah, they paid to, five grand for their, for their yeah. classic, no entry fee. They have a classic every year. Your lodging is paid for no entry fee guaranteed five grand to the winner. It's a, uh, it's, it's pretty solid for a club scene. So appreciate those guys. And it's, it's always good to be working with them. And we actually, just joined up with a new uh the new tournament trail that we're going to be uh tying in with this year with the the Slay Nation boys. Um yeah. shout out to our buddy Frankie Poliferone, Pro- aka Frankie Povalone. Um hey. we're going to be uh displaying with them on their tournament jerseys and their tournament banners this year and uh we're we're excited about that. So um shout out to them and Hopefully, 2022 is going to be an awesome year for uh, for all those guys involved with us. This yeah, and if you guys got a club and you guys want to know more about what Riz is talking about, you can reach out to anybody out here at the Bash U Riz or our customer service thing or whatever. Yep. We got PTC, some really, Andre Alvarez. Really, <laughs> hit us up <laughs> at Team really no Fish stuff. Club guys out there for sure. Yep, yep. But we got a Facebook like and share winner here, Pete. Um, we're ready to. Uh, to fire that Brent. off, we got uh, we got Brent Freeman um, coming in from uh, down there in Georgia in uh, the professional fish head land. Um, Brent Freeman, you are the winner of tonight's Facebook like and share. Thanks for uh, supporting the Bash University Live podcast. Thank you very much, and congratulations. And thank you, guys. I appreciate you. I know BTC had a hard day. Appreciate you being here. Riz, thank you, sir. And uh, – you know, JK, uh, congratulations, All Americans. Yes, sir. <laughs> Nobody's surprised. Don't JK, don't worry. You keep getting these accolades. Nobody's surprised anymore, man. We know we <laughs> we know that you we know that you have what it takes, whether you're in the back of the boat or the front of the boat. So it's uh yeah. no surprise to see you back in the all American from the boater's position, man. And we're 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 yeah. we're we're wishing you well. Yeah, man. Um, Man, and we are we are going to be setting up a text chain for you and and Matt and and Mike <laughs> yeah uh, Mike Reed to all we will we want to know man how the tournaments are going and we wish you the best it's going to be it's going to be awesome we're all going to be following you on the All American and thank you Daniel Fennel uh, for coming on and hanging yeah. out with us yes. uh, we're putting on an amazing tournament trail and uh, it was it was great. It was great to meet him and and uh, and hear what's going on at the BFLs. Look forward to 
you know, participating again next year. So, awesome. just, Justin, with all the success you've had and, and how it just keeps, do you, are you starting to feel the pressure yet? Um, what are you, are you putting demons in his head? No, I'm just DC saying, like, you know, maybe, maybe, I feel like you're kind of almost supposed to win. <laughs> well, no, I, I wouldn't say that. I don't think I am. <laughs> I think, but I do think, uh, there's pressure because there's, you're representing more than just yourself out there. You yeah. know, I definitely feel okay. that uh, I'm wearing the Bash U flag. You know, I'm, I'm representing us. I, I'm definitely, um, but nobody's out, out, you know, nobody's outside of a possible bad day or bad tournament or anything. I get that. But yeah, I, I threw up on the last day, the morning of the last day. Did you I knew, what? I, I knew I had a chance to win. Um, even 10 pounds behind or nine or six, whatever, I guess 10 pounds behind, like I was, um, I had, you know, I could have had 34, 35 pounds on day one. And that's crazy to say, because I've never had a dirty 30. I've never weighed in over 25, you know, but that's what was, that's what bit my, that's what bit my top water on day one. So I knew anything was possible down there. Oh, you know, Florida is the land of comebacks, you know, and, uh, sure. and I, knew it, and, and I well, knew it was, and I had nerves and uh, I made the wrong decision on day three and Matt made the right one. You know, I chased bites and the uh, breakdown, you know, is probably what prevented me from running on eight to nine miles back down chasing the morning, the right morning tide that I figured would be, but I was stuck. You know, I felt that I had to stay up and, and, go chase the incoming tide. So I had to de delay my day. You know, I knew it was very likely that I'd be zero at 1130 like I was, but man, a lot, a lot of what we've talked about um, at Bash U went a long way for me on day three and just saving my all American bid, you know? So without you, up, did, what, did, you, did, you, did you literally throw up and when did it happen? Uh, before I could get in the truck and drive to the ramp. Wow. I'm gonna oh, get my, you know, and I've talked about it, you know, I've struggled with some anxiety and stuff here this year recently with my, the illness and stuff that's gone on. I battled some, some mental stuff for sure. And I'm open about it and, uh, I'm getting a lot stronger and, and I think talking about it helps and, and stuff. And, and, uh, and I think there's just some, something there that, uh, it's not like I'm spun out or anything. It's just, I've got, <laughs> I basically had to puke just to get myself. Okay. We're good now. That's pretty <laughs> rad, know? dude. I love it. Dude. I love dude, it too. Every day, how many, how many, every day, all three days, all, every three more, all three mornings last November of the all American. But I put some pressure on myself to win that one. I, I wanted that one bad. It was close to home. I wanted that one bad. I mean, how many it, it happens? How many NFL coaches and NFL players that uh, they go through that same process, man? It's uh, <laughs> it's your so it, it, what it is is it, it's a testament to your passion and mm -hmm. your commitment to what you're doing, man. It's it's that powerful. It's that important. And yeah. uh, honestly, when that goes away, you're it's time to move on to the next thing. You know? Yeah. I hope there's there's not a next thing. I, I want to. I want to be in bass fishing until, till the end, man. I, I just freaking love it, you know, and it does what? so many positive things for the world. You well, know, our, our group of bass fishermen, it's just, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know, man. It's just still, we hold, we value a lot of special things that are old hat to a lot of people, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, and just a lot, it's a, it's a special family. That's what it is. Bass fishing, you know, well, it, it, well said, and, and in that mm. case, we hope you keep puking. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <brother. laughs> that's awesome, man. I I don't know that I could get myself that that tensed up that I throw up, you know. Mm. But yeah, I, I I it's not like I'm doing that. It just is like that's how I wake up. No, I, I know Mike gets like that. He gets so <laughs> so, so I, spun out when he catches a big one. He throws up. Yeah, you know and that's yeah. like. That was wrong with you, dude. But uh, it's, it's just a, intensity. It's, it's, you yeah. guys admitted it, so I'm, I, it's a little embarrassing uh -oh. for me. But I don't, I don't go that way. I you go the other way. 
<laughs> Fucking Pete, did you? Oh. <laughs> everybody, everybody manages their anxiety in their own way. So you shit yeah. your pants. <laughs> yeah. Hey, like we we told this all night live. Got to have a modium AD in the boat, man. That's right. Dude, you better be careful. You might you might get on that dude wipes pro staff with Gerald Swindle or something. Oh my gosh. That would be a perfect that would be a perfect sponsor for me. <laughs> so we're gonna can't leave even you on know. that that horrible note. <laughs> oh that, it was great show. Appreciate all you guys, Dude. man. What what a way to end the show, man. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's it's the enthusiasm, it's the passion that, that we all share and we love, and it's it's yeah. it's it, it's a great sport. And we're all going to be at it. PTC, we got to get you out there next year. You yeah, know? I'll get out there and shit my pants with you. <laughs> 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 Let's go. <Come> on. Uh, <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. That's you. Um, Man, I can't believe I just said that. But uh, <laughs> me either, Pete. I felt it coming. I'm I, like, is he going to say he shits his pants? Dude, I'm, I'm telling you right now, there's at least half the people are like, me too. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. The numbers just dropped. In. I guarantee you, you are. I guarantee yeah. you. Hey, it is what it is. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody, for watching and putting up with all this nonsense. Thank you, Daniel Fennell. Thanks for all for the All-Americans uh, that, that hung out with us tonight. Of course, you, JK, and... Uh, BTC and the Riz, and uh, we're going to be back with another Bash University live real soon. We'll keep you guys posted, and uh, have a great night, everybody. Thanks for watching. <laughs>